I would like to call the Prince William County School Board meeting to order. Uh, I'd like to move to the first item and approval of the closed session agenda. Motion is in order for the approval. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Ms. Jesse. I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the closed session agenda as recommended. Is there a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. I second. Ralston. I second. Discussion? Please vote. Uh, what did she say? Uh, Hit refresh. F5. Yes. F5. Okay. Oh, okay. You can't see a thing. Okay. Why am I? Uh, Your mic's still on. Okay. Your mic's on. Yeah. The vote is five yes, three absent. Deutsch, Williams, and Trenum. Motion passed. Moving on to the motion to enter closed session. A motion's in order. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Jesse. I move that pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3711, the Prince William County School Board, and a closed session for the following reason. One, to discuss the appointment and release of specific employees under Virginia Codes 2.2-3711-A1 A and A2, to consult with legal counsel and staff to take action regarding the services provided and renewal of annual retainer agreement for legal services provided by James Council under Virginia Codes 2.2-3711-A1 .2 and A3 to review and take action on student requests for religi religious exemption under Virginia Codes 2.2-3711-A2 .2 and A3 to discuss the appointment of student representative to the school board for the 2018-19 school year under Virginia Codes 2.2-3711-A1 .2 and 2. Four, to discuss with legal counsel and staff legal issues related to proposed rezoning under the new profit law, Senate Bill 549, under Virginia Codes 2.2-3711-A3 .2 and A5, to discuss the Division Council specific legal issues involving school board employees requiring the advice of counsel under Virginia Codes 2.2-3711-A1 .2 and 8. And finally, six, to discuss the staff and legal, with staff and legal counsel, the acquisition of specific sites for school purposes under Virginia Codes 2.2-3711A, 3, 6, and 8. Do I have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Ralston. I second. Discussion? Please vote. Vote is five yes, motion passed. The Prince William County School Board will now enter closed session and return to open session in approximately, and I say this very loosely, one hour. It took almost an hour to read the agenda, so um, thank you. The school Board is now returning to open session from closed session. We're gonna move to 8.01, uh, which is the closed session action items. Do I have a motion for that recommended action? Mr. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Jessie. I move that the Prince William County School Board appoint Sarah Farrell Sarah. as student representative to the board and appoint Wilf Wilfredo Villatoro and Annabelle Berg Bergen, Bergen, Bergen as alternate, super, alternate representative school board for the 2018-19 school year. Ms. Do I have a second? I second. Discussion? Please vote.
Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Is Mr. Deutsch at the dais? No. 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 Well, I'm waiting for him. Just, I'll just put, I'll mark him. Thank you. The vote is seven, yes, one not present vote. Deutsch, motion passed. Okay, we'll move on to the adoption of the closed session consent agenda. Can I have a motion? Mr. Chairman. 9.01. Yeah, 9.01. Yeah, Ms. Yes. Jesse. I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the closed session agenda as recommended. Appointment and releases of specific employees renewal of annual retainer agreement for legal services provided by James Council, request for a religious exemption from compulsory school attendance. Uh, do I have a second? Mr. Chairman? Yep. A second? Any discussion? Please vote. Vote is seven, yes, one not present at vote. Deutsch, motion passed. Moving on to closed session certification. A motion is in order. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Ms. Jessup. I move that pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3712, the closed session agenda, the closed session of the Prince William County School Board, Board meeting on June 20th, 2018, be certified by adopting the following resolution. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the Prince William County School Board hereby certifies to the best of each member's knowledge only public business matters lawfully exempted from opening meeting requirements were discussed in closed meeting to which this certification resolution applies. And two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard and discussed or considered by the school board. Is there a second? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Ms. Second. Williams. Discussion? Please vote. Vote is eight, yes, unanimous. Motion passed. I would like to call this meeting of the Prince William County School Board to order. First, we'll take a moment of silence. Next, I'd like to ask if there are any students in the audience, if they'd like to lead, lead in the Pledge of Allegiance. Come on up, my friend. Introduce yourself and we'll start your, we'll start the pledge. If everyone could please rise. Thank you, my friend. Next, we're going to move to 13.01, um, the approval of the public meeting agenda. A motion is in order. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams. I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the public meeting agenda as recommended. Do I have a second? 
Any discussion? Please vote. I'm sorry, Dr. Latif, I didn't hear who seconded the motion. Thank you. Vote is eight yes, unanimous, motion passed. Good, We're moving on to the adoption of the consent agenda. A um, motion is in order. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Williams. I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the public meeting consent agenda as recommended. Um, Mr. Chairman, I second. You're talking about the adoption of the consent agenda, 1401. Yeah. Right. Okay. Do I have discussion? Please vote. Vote is eight yes, unanimous, motion passed. We'll move on to citizen comments. Moving on to the citizen comments, the agenda and non-agenda items. It looks like we have tonight 11 speakers. We will do them all. Um, that uh, Nine that signed up in advance and two that have signed up at the door. Everyone that signed up in advance will have a chance, everyone will have a chance to speak. I will call the first 10 names and ask you to take a seat in the front row now, if you don't mind. Don Richardson, Chrissy Falls, Sama Oko, Okiowa, Okiowo, Tara Kidwell, Mark Rafa, Steve Bender, Riley O'Casey, Charles Ronco, Kate Olson Flynn, Karen Yaw, Jennifer Gilly. You will have three minutes to speak and the clerk will keep the time. The lights on the monitor will indicate your progress. The yellow light will signify that you should sum up your position. Red light indicates your time is up and you should stop. Please use proper decorum and manners while at the podium. I will keep to three minutes, um, and I'll try to do that for everyone and be consistent, so please um, uh, understand that I'm trying to stay consistent across the board. If you do not do so, you'll be asked to step aside. Please give your name and address for the record when you approach the podium. Our first speaker is Don Richardson. Our next speaker is Chrissy Falls. Good evening, Dr. Latif, board, Dr. Waltz. I was here two weeks ago to talk to you all about communication and collaboration on some very important topics that my nonprofit, other community members, small businesses, and other nonprofits and agencies in this area. Um, our topics include bullying, drugs, gang awareness, human trafficking, internet safety, and mental health, as well as some other issues. What I'm asking is for your cooperation. Um, Woodbridge High School actually put on an, a phenomenal internet safety presentation. They had 25 people show up. We just need your help. Let us in. Um, also, Ashley, Miss, Miss Jesse, you got an email this morning from Supervisor Anderson's office. She's doing an information night in August, August 16th of Woodbridge High School on gangs. These are all topics that not only affect our community, but affect our children. If it's not affecting them directly, it's affecting them indirectly. Um, mental health is a big problem with, with our students. I know my daughter alone has experienced in just her little sixth grade life, a lot. Um, seven friends were cutting. Kids have talked about attempting suicide. The bullying on the internet is, is nothing that any of us could imagine because none of us grew up in this. But these topics are important. 
We have people from the front line. We work with Homeland Security, Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, um, the amazing police department that we have and all of their task force within that, the Commonwealth Attorney. But we have these topics. We're not telling your kids what to do. We're having these discussions. They're not political debates. They're actual discussions. A few of you have been to a few of our presentations, and I encourage you to ask your schools to have us back. Have us in there. It, they're, they're done in the evening. The parents can come out. For instance, internet safety. If you've got a child in, in a school right now, you didn't grow up with it. These are scary things that our kids and we hold in our hands. Um, and a lot of these topics come straight from those phones. You know, handing a kid elementary school, those kids are being trafficked online and people, they don't even realize it. Um, but open your doors, let us in, you know, it's free. We don't charge anything. You know, we do this out of the kindness of our heart. I did this to learn how to educate my kids because it's a scary world that they live in. So I'm here, I'm winging this one. Usually you get a preaching from me for three minutes, but I ask you to open your doors, let us in, give me a call. We're Y Incorporated and we will bring these hard to talk about discussions to you and it helps the parents go home and reiterate what they heard and spoke about, and it, and it helps guide that, that talk. Thank you. Thank you. Sama, <laughs> Sama Okiowo. Good evening, Dr. Latif and distinguished uh, board members. My name is Nsama Okiowo, 43 Falson Place, Dumfries, Virginia. I'm a teacher in the county. I moved here in Prince William County two years, uh, in 2002 to live here and to work here. I'm a teacher, like I said. Soon after becoming a United States citizen, I embarked on being a model citizen by being a responsible uh, patriot. One of the things I always wanted to do was to be an elections officer, however, I was very saddened by the fact that I could not get civil leave to go and do my job as an elections officer with Prince William County Schools. So, Fairfax County, on the other hand, took care of this in 2014 with uh, a regulation which is called administrative leave for employees serving as election officers. 4833.2. If you people on the board should decide to talk to Prince William County government officials, you would learn that there's a shortage of elections officers because teachers and other workers cannot get approved leave. I am therefore imploring you today to look into this issue with your counterparts in the county, as the election process is pertinent in a democratic society, and any employee wishing to serve should not have to forfeit their pay on that day. Thank you. Thank you. Can the clerk set the timer up, please? Debbie, I don't have a timer up on the screen. Uh, Tara Kidwell. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board, Dr. Waltz, members of the Prince William County Administration. My name is Tara Kidwell, and my address is on file with the clerk. I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. As a parent of a tuition-paying student in Prince William County Schools, as well as a 17-year veteran of the school system. In 2008, when my husband and I moved to Warren County to find more affordable housing, we knew that should we have children, they would need to be attending schools in Prince William County Schools. However, we were not fully prepared for the financial impact that having a tuition paying student would have on us. This year, that impact became our reality. Our son, Caden, started school as a very excited kindergartner this year. And as an employee, I was granted the 10% discount. Looking forward to next year, we are thankful for the 25% discount that will save us, as our family, nearly $20,000 over the course of his education. Further, if the possible 50% discount for employees was to be granted, 
over $40,000 would be saved by the time he graduates from Prince William County Schools. Additionally, I asked the board to consider an alternative means of collection, such as twice a month allotments of the tuition funds for Prince William County School employees. As an employee, would it not be possible to collect the funds from my paycheck prior to me receiving it? The multiple allotments of automatic payments would alleviate the significant hardship on our family of coming up with large sums of money at two of the costliest times of the year, the start of each school year and post-Christmas holiday to cover the cost of his tuition. It is not feasible for us to have our son attend school in the county in which we live due to our very full work schedules. Furthermore, we want Caden to have the best possible education and feel that the expectations in Prince William County Public Schools offer forward him a future over the next 12 years for access to a curriculum with high academic rigor, opportunities to participate in after school clubs and activities, involvement in the arts, music, and interscholastic sports at both the middle and the high school level, and challenging classes to best prepare him for post-secondary education. For these reasons, I am hopeful that you will consider alternative means of payment and voting for the 50% tuition discount to employees of those children who are thriving as students in the Prince William County school system. I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mark Rafa. Steve Bender. Good evening, board. My name is Steve Bender. My address is still on file with the clerk, although I'm thinking of changing it to 14715 Bristow Road. Uh, these meetings are all too long. Uh, there are several things I wanted to talk about tonight. Some of them have been pulled off the agenda. The motion to transfer the clerk to the supervision of the superintendent is misguided, and I'm glad that it was pulled. Um, nobody else in the area does that except for Fairfax City because the clerk is also the executive assistant to the superintendent. There are two references in the code to general direction. One is the clerk under the general direction of the superintendent. There are 703 references in Virginia code to supervision. He's responsible for giving them their office space and stuff like that, not for evaluating them and governing their, their employment. That's you guys, so keep that. Secondly, um, Dr. Latif, when you were appointed to the board a few weeks back, you and I had a short discussion, and one of the things you told me is you're not Ryan Sawyers. I appreciate that. Uh, I would agree that your personalities are diametrically opposed, and you're not his personality, but Mr. Trenum asked for several things to go onto the agenda tonight for action, and instead they were just put on for information. And one of the things that I was told is that with this new leadership, when the three Republican-backed members of the board ask for stuff, they will, um, they will get it put on the agenda. Well, I guess you need to be more clear, guys, and ask for it to be put on exactly as you requested. Because I'm seeing a lot of the same game, gamesmanship and politicalization. Um, the infrastructure problem that you've already put out a campaign video on is, again, I'm not sure you fully understand the situation. We can't accelerate it much more because we'll hit the 10% cap on our bond rating and whatever we think we might be saving, we'll be spending in higher interest because our bond rating will have dropped. So that's, that's a pitfall that's waiting for you if you pursue that any further. Finally, uh, this woman, I'm chief at Noakesville Precinct. I'd like to know who told her she couldn't serve because that person broke the law. When you're appointed to serve on a jury, when you're subpoenaed, when you're appointed as an election officer, that's a civic duty that your employer can't say no to. They can ask you to not do it, but they can't refuse. So that's got to be investigated and figure out what broke there because that shouldn't have happened. And I'm hearing the, the people over here on staff say, no, we do that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Riley O'Casey. 
Good evening, Dr. Latif, board members, Dr. Waltz. My name is Riley O'Casey, and my address is on file. As a classroom teacher, every summer, I reflected over the success and struggles of the past year. I believed it was necessary to look at what could be improved upon for my students and their success. As we celebrate the conclusion of the 2017-18 school year, I challenged the board and the division to reflect on the year, what went well and what could be improved. While the students of Prince William County Schools will always be our first priority, I would like to respectfully remind both the board and the division that the 10,000 plus employees are just as important. I recently read a quote that stated, talented employees stay because they are paid well, appreciated, okay, somebody doing this on purpose? <laughs> it's moving, okay. Uh, paid well, appreciated, listened to, involved in decisions, trusted and respected. This is not always the case in Prince William County Schools and we are losing too many employees because other school divisions wholeheartedly believe that their employees should be paid well, listened to and involved in decision making. And these same school divisions appreciate, trust and respect their employees. When will this happen in our school division? Dr. Waltz, I urge you and your staff to reflect on this past year and consider the actions that need to take place to restore the trust that has been broken with your employees. What simple but deliberate actions can be taken to raise morale? Perhaps understanding the six characteristics I listed may be the way that, to start. Board members, instead of continuing to vote along party lines, consider voting for what's right for our students and employees. This action alone can make the change that Prince William County schools need to improve. Thank you. Thank you. Charles Ronco. Good evening. My name is Charles Ronco. My address is on file with the clerk. Uh, and uh, I just want to say, um, first of all, it's good to see everyone again. Uh, I haven't been up here in a little while. But, um, and you know that I don't come up here very often, and I don't come up here um, for no reason. But I saw something on the agenda tonight that really struck my attention, because I think that it actually will do a great deal of good. And it's uh, agenda item 18.09, which is the uh, sending one, if you're a certificated employee that hasn't been in the classroom, that you spend one day in the classroom. Because I think that this actually will get a lot of change occurring, and I think it, it'll do it in the right way. All too often, the generals at the top of the food chain don't know what's happening in the trenches. And the people in the trenches look at the people at the top of the hill and they say, you know, they have no idea what's going on. They, they're just disconnected from us. And that's where morale breaks down. So this agenda item, if we can actually implement it in whatever fashion its final form is in, you know, I'm sure that it'll go through different changes as it goes through its process. It'll do two things. Well, three. One, yes, it might alleviate a little bit of, of, of stress, very small amount of stress on the lack of substitutes, but it's, it's minuscule. But the two big things that it's gonna do is one, it's gonna let the people at the top know what it's like, and they're gonna be able to see, even if it's just you know, passing out a test and you know, monitoring the kids for an afternoon, I mean, it's just to kind of get their feet wet one more time. And that's not a bad thing. But the other thing that it's going to do, and this is where I think the morale is really going to change, is because the people on the ground are going to say, wait a minute, you know, they're here with us. They're, they're doing what we do for a day. And even if they don't interact with them, even if they have nothing to say to them, even if they just see them in the hallway a little bit more because they're, you know, taking care of the classroom down the hall, they're going to be more visible. They're going to feel more, in, you know, more connected to that, to, that to that general at the top of the food chain. And I think that that really will make a difference. And I'm really hoping that that agenda item gets proper attention and that the, the conversation continues and somewhere down the road, some final form hits the books. So thank you very much for your time tonight. Have a great night. Thank you.
Thank you. Kate Olson Flynn. Good evening. My name is Kate Olson Flynn, and my address is on file. Uh, good evening, board, Chairman Latif, uh, Superintendent Waltz, and happy summer. <laughs> um, I'm here to talk about hope. Because of your actions, to build a turf field at Woodbridge Senior High School, I can't tell you how many parents and children have thanked us for working so hard to turf the field. They are so very grateful that their children will be safe when playing their sport of choice. Thank you, all of you, for giving our community hope, showing them that you care enough to listen to their concerns and act and replace the field. Although we still have significant issues with our facilities that I will save for another board meeting at another time, <laughs> I do want to thank you for the field. But I'm also here to ask you to provide hope for the academic and tech programs at Woodbridge Senior High School. In 2016, you decided to take away our beloved specialty program, the Center for Fine and Performing Arts. And because you did this, I'm here to ask and implore you to provide Woodbridge with a new specialty program in its place, to make Woodbridge Senior High School special and unique again. And that, in that way, you'd give hope and pride back to our community, not feeling that they're left behind anymore. And this is something that this hope would give to the kids and the community because they deserve it and they need it. Thank you. Karen Yaw. Good evening, Dr. Latif, Dr. Walsh, and members of the school board. Karen Yaw is my name, and my address is also on file. This evening, I'd like to bring to your attention some challenges I, as well as other parents, are having with the administration at uh, West Ridge Elementary School. According to the Code of Behavior under student rights, children have the right to be welcomed into a caring, nurturing, and safe learning environment. In fact, I know the school board has worked painstakingly to review and revise the Code of Behavior to ensure children are receiving an equitable, and valuable school experience. Unfortunately, the school administrators at Westridge Elementary have failed to uphold their end of the bargain for all students. Instead of courtesy, respect, and fairness, some parents and students alike have been met with partiality and ultimately unfair treatment. When, student, when a student is injured or when student injuries are not reported or do not receive proper treatment, their rights are violated. When student complaints of bullying are overlooked, their rights are violated. When some students are punished while others get a free pass, their rights are violated. When a student earns an award and does not receive it, her rights are violated. When parental input is undermined and discouraged, parent and student rights are violated. I know that Prince William County's school division culture values the individual, diversity, as well as the best decision making, and, and as well as believes that the best decision making is one that is collaborative. The strategic goals also carefully outline the need for qualified, diverse, and motivated faculty. Unfortunately, West Ridge's lack of, self, of staff diversity and poor interaction with some families do not reflect the core values of the division's culture. Additionally, the cultural awareness and responsive training recently co conducted promotes a global mindset and respect for all cultures. While there is a need for such training, there is also a need to make sure 
that school administrators are carrying through their commitment. For these reasons, I'm appealing to the board to investigate the conduct of the administrators at Westridge, as well as ensure that the staff continues to reflect the vision of a world-class education for all. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Gilly? Gilly, sorry. Gilly. Good evening, my name is Jennifer Gilly and my address is on file. I wanted to come for the last meeting this year so that I can personally wish you all a happy summer. I graduated my first child this year, but I'm bringing a ninth grader in to take his place at Woodbridge High School. We appreciate all, all of you hearing us and taking our comments to heart regarding Woodbridge High School and helping us get the field that the kids deserve and need. Um, like my friend said, we have had lots of parents and children come. They're very excited about the field and can't wait for them to start working on it. We're very proud of our community and we want our children to be too. We know that there's a lot on the books to be done at Woodbridge this summer, but there's still a lot more to do. That, like Kate says, will come to another meeting. So I'll be back with my friends in September. I will see you then. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll move to um, 16.01, proposed rezoning uh, Gainesville Crossing. This is an action item. Do I have a motion as an order? Mr. Chairman, I move the Prince William County School Board for the development impact statement for the Gainesville Crossing rezoning that includes the school board's rezoning statement. However, the school board does not support any rezoning that increases the student capacity of Prince William County Public Schools already at or in excess of 100% capacity or rezoning that causes student capacity at any school to exceed 100% capacity. Do I have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Satterwhite. I'll second that motion. Thank you. Is there a discussion? Please vote. Vote is eight yes, unanimous, motion passed. Okay, next we'll move to 16.02, proposed rezoning Brady's Hill. Uh, this item is on for action, a motion is in order. Mr. Chairman, I move the Princeton County School Board approve the development impact statement for the Brady Hills rezoning that includes the school board's rezoning statement. Quote, however, the school board does not support any rezoning that increases student capacity at Princeton County Public Schools already at or in excess of 100% capacity or rezoning that causes student capacity at any school to exceed 100% capacity, unquote. Do I have a second? Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Trenum. I'll second. Thank you. Any discussion? Please vote. Vote is eight yes, unanimous, motion passed. Thank you, We're moving on to 16.03, the budget CIP update. Um, Mr. Klein, this item is on for information, thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Waltz. Uh, I'm here this evening to provide an update relative to the final budget adjustments for the FY 2019 budget in a very in a very brief summary if, you, summary, if you recall, back on March 22nd, the board had adopted a budget for submission to the Board of County Supervisors, uh, understanding at that point that we were still waiting to find out what would happen with the uh, uh, final budget for the General Assembly as well. On April 24th, the Board of County Supervisors had adopted a budget that increased our, our budget and appropriation uh, by $500,000 as discussed at our budget meeting with the supervisors in order to fund an elementary school security pilot program. Uh, May the 30th, the General Assembly did ab adopt a budget, and as we were hoping, if you will, they had adopted the House version, 
which brought our budget to within $187,000 of the uh, uh, almost $1.5 billion of the total budget. Uh, the adjustment uh, for reconciling the $187,000 was reducing the holdback allocation by that amount. Uh, our budget and appropriation in that sense stands as approved by the, by the Board of County Supervisors, who is the budgeting and appropriating body for us. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. Deutsch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Klein, this is the only uh, item with your name on it uh, for this meeting. I just wanted to uh, express my appreciation uh, for the time that you've uh, been in your position here in the school board, the way that you've worked us through uh, the budgets and facilities, um, and congratulate you on um, the next steps in your life. Thank you very much, sir. Well, thank you. What, one last opportunity at the dice. <laughs> yeah. Any other Wouldn't want to miss out. Questions, Jesse. Quick thing, Mr. Klein, because I was looking at the proposed funding and what we had, what we thought we were getting from the state and what I saw that we were getting from the state, from the VA, DOE, and I, I came up with an increase. Is that true that we're getting, maybe I'm looking at numbers that we we're, actually got. We're reduced by 187938 from what was the adjustment combination. We, ad we adjusted to the Board of County Supervisors number and in doing so to reconcile to that number and the state revenue, we, re we actually reduced by 187938 So there was a further, like what you're saying, I guess I'm not a, a math guy, but there was further numbers and calculations right. put into there. Okay. Okay. Because I was just but, looking at baseline numbers that the v, you know, VA DOE right. said. So it and, looked and like we... that certainly is, and, and that's typical in the sense of the state generating numbers, and then we have to go and adapt it to our individual circumstances within the, within the school division. But... Uh, I, I think that is certainly we did, we did about as well as I would have hoped uh, when we were going through the budget process. So sometimes it's, it, sometimes it just pays to be lucky as well. Thank you, Mr. Klein, and thank you for your service, Ms. Williams. Right there. Um, question, which does not need to be answered now, because um, my brain's not going to get it. So I'm sure there's many others like me out there. But I think the general understanding is, or assumption for uh, is from the public, or at least mine was, that the state approved a budget and there's money in there for salary for teacher increases and all of these things that we've kind of heard in the media. And by no means do I need you to answer this tonight, but I'm wondering if maybe we could come up with some sort of uh, basic explanation um, that could be posted maybe on our website that explains how um, there's a reduction for us instead of an increase, because I think that question is definitely coming and I know I don't have an answer to it, and um, I don't think it has to go down to our line item per budget, but maybe just a, we, a yes, general We could do that. I, th I think in a very simplistic thing tonight, I can answer a little bit, and then we'll come back with, with detail. But, but in a sense, when the, uh, the House version basically provided for the adoption of Medicaid, which in turn generated additional monies, it also provided uh, essentially an increase in funding statewide from the lottery. Overall, that provided additional monies. The state did not fund a pay raise in FY 2019. When they adopt a budget, they adopt a two-year budget. So while there's discussion about a pay raise, the pay raise that is at this point projected for uh, the state is for next year. So effective July 1, 2019, contingent upon revenues uh, keeping pace as projected for the state through the following year, then the state would contribute their share of the 3% raise in FY20. And again, we're starting in FY19. So I know that that piece has generated some confusion. Thank you, Mr. Klein. And again, um, just to echo Mr. Deutsch's comments, I won't get to ask you any more questions from the dais, but I do wish you um, well in your retirement. I'm sure you'll be around a little bit anyway. Mr. Tranum. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Chairman. Uh, first off, thank you, Mr. Klein. I feel like I echo all the comments as far as uh, we've been working together for 11 years now, and it's been a, a, a very rewarding relationship, working relationship. Um, I, I do, I, I think we were, um, I would like to say that we were really smart as a board and came this close, knowing that we were kind of not ha had a, had some unknown numbers out there as far as what what the allocations were and that we were just smart enough to figure that they were going to get this close i think there's sometimes it's 
better to be lucky than good. Um, but I think this is good. Uh, I, I agree with Ms. Williams. I think we need to explain uh, very clearly uh, the language about state funding for raises and how that relates to our budget adoption. Okay. Um, if you need eight thousand dollars more, I know where I would go get it first, and it would be out of the school board budget. But that's a different conversation. So, um, but anyway, uh, that's all I had, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Satterwhite. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Klein, I also want to congratulate you on your retirement. We do look forward to seeing you when you come back and rock with us. Um, but thank you for all the years you've taken all of our um, many, many budget questions, including from a budget committee. Uh, we appreciate your answering all of those and um, meeting with us all of the many times you met with us for CIP. And um, thank you for all the work you've done with this division. Um, I do have a question related to this. You mentioned the adding the $500,000 to the school security pilot program. Is that school sec security pilot program something the school board is going to have to vote on, or is that something we're just moving forward with? We were moving forward with it in the context that when we were actually uh, having the discussion back in the work session, we'd indicated that to the extent that there were changes or adjustments to be made within the, the overall budget, that the superintendent would move forward with it. Likewise, with the, the discussion with the Board of County Supervisors in the joint meeting and absent any discussion or concern from the board, we, we were taking the exact amount that they are increasing our budget and appropriation. Uh, that's funded in the uh, risk management budget and will go strictly to support that particular program. Okay, are we going to be implementing that program this fall? We are in the process as we speak of, uh, we've done job descriptions, we are posting the materials, we're moving forward on it. I can't say it's gonna be there on opening day, but we are moving as fast as we can, keeping in mind that there's a significant amount of uh, in the sense of, of training, but there's also a significant amount of work in collaboration with the police department to ensure that we're, they, they facilitate uh, sitting in on interviews, for example. They will provide the weapons training, that type of thing. So we are progressing with it at, essentially as fast as we can. But yes, as soon as we can get it up and running, uh, we will have that for you. And certainly we could provide a description to the board of what, what we have there if you'd like. Okay, that would be great, and thank you. I'm excited about that collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Klein. Congratulations on your retirement, and thank you for your many years of service to this school system. Okay. Moving on to superintendent's time. Thank you. I would like to begin by congratulating the graduating class of 2018. This year, our graduates earned more than $74 million in scholarships. This is nearly $18 million more than last year. The total includes 19 military academy appointments and 50 athletic scholarships. Congratulations, class of 2018. We are very proud of your many accomplishments and wish you tremendous success. A team from Ronald Reagan Middle School capped off a successful season with a second place win in the 2018 Odyssey of the Mind World Finals. The tournament was held at Iowa State University with more than 835 elementary, middle, high school, and college teams from around the world competing to solve complex problems before a large international audience. Congratulations to Lori Ann Pollock, a fifth grade teacher at Penn Elementary School. Ms. Pollock earned the Prince William County Public Schools Excellence in Science Teaching Award. I recently had the pleasure of attending three outstanding community events, the annual Ramadan Interfaith Dinner, the Optimus International Club of Manassas Education Award Ceremony, and the amazing National Capital A Cinderella Ball, honoring special needs youth, military personnel, and students from the House Leadership Academy. I also enjoyed attending one more graduation uh, ceremony than I reported last time, and that was Brentsville District High School. I would like to share an update on the practice field at Woodbridge High School. In January, a portion of that practice field caught fire, likely uh, caused by someone shooting off fireworks, our risk management uh, group believes. This first slide shows a picture of the damaged field, uh, which uh, you saw 
Uh, at the time, members of the community and staff were very concerned that the field was destroyed and needed to be rebuilt. The Office of Facility Services recommended that we allow the field to grow back because the grass is Bermuda and has a very deep root system. So you can see by the next slide, uh, I'm happy to share a recent picture of the field showing that the grass has grown back and the field, can we get the next slide, the nice green, yeah, uh, is now being used. And with our uh, capital construction and improvements that we're gonna be doing at Woodbridge, there's additional uh, improvements to this field and the field area that are uh, in the queue. There's no way I could conclude my remarks without recognizing that tonight is the last school board meeting for our amazing associate superintendent for finance and support services, Dave Klein, and our amazing human resources associate superintendent, Keith J. Johnson. Both have been essential to the school division in these board meetings for a very long time. No one has a better understanding of how to get the biggest education bang for the buck from a school budget than Dave Klein. As you've seen, he has encyclopedic knowledge of where every dollar comes from and how it's spent. That helped us to continue growing and succeeding through very tough financial times that created severe issues for many other school divisions, and it's led to successful budgets year after year in Prince William County without laying off a single employee. Dave's management team and his skills helped us to run one of the largest transportation fleets in the nation to open and operate the equivalent of nearly 100 restaurants every morning and to keep our schools safe and to build and open, not to mention upgrading dozens of others, built and opened 23 new schools on time and within budget over the last 13 years. He will be a hard act to follow and I'm only mentioning that uh, last piece in the time that I've been here. I've had the honor of working with Keith Johnson for well over two decades and in three school systems. He has turned our human resources department into the recipient of the division's highest stakeholder satisfaction ratings year after year. That is not easy to accomplish when you have to recruit, evaluate, and hire over 800 teachers a year or deal with the concerns, the changing needs, the professional development requirements, changes in employee benefits, et cetera, et cetera, of over 11,000 employees. And he has done this with fewer staff, but more empathy, effectiveness, and expertise than just about anyone around. He will be missed. Both of these gentlemen have given more to this school division, their colleagues, and our students than we could ever repay. They richly deserve all the great experiences that retirement will bring. And I'd ask them both to stand and be recognized. Finally, I am grateful to all the stakeholders, employees, parents, guardians, and of course the students of Prince William County Public Schools for their help and success this year. Thank you to our elected officials, business partners, and our community for supporting Prince William County Public Schools. I wish everyone a safe and enjoyable summer, and I look forward to our students returning on August 27th for the beginning of another great school year. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Waltz. Uh, we're gonna move on to 1801, uh, moving on to uh, in board matters. The appointment of committee to recommend a proposed model for the Ombudsman Office. Uh, this item is on for action. Um, I will, um, can I have a motion? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Jesse. I move that pursuant to policy 122.02, the Prince William County School Board authorize the chairman to appoint Gil Trenum and Lori Williams to a committee to recommend a proposed model for the Office of the Ombudsman, working in conjunction with the school board's directive that the division council and other Office of Equity and Compliance develop and update procedures for the reporting, investigation, and resolution of complaints against Prince William County <coughs> School employees. Do I have a second? A second. Mr. Deutsch, thank you. Discussion? Please vote. 
Oh, sorry, Gil. Uh, you, go ahead. Gil first. Okay. Just. So I, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to say uh, I look forward to actually working with this uh, with Ms. Williams and uh, the Division Council and our, and our staff on this over the summer. I think it's a good step forward, and uh, I'm, I'm excited about it. Thank you. Ms. Williams? I'm just going to echo Mr. Trenum's uh, excitement over here. It would be a nice change of pace from you, I mean, working with you on numbers. But I look forward to the same smile again, and I expect and hope that um, as this committee is formed uh, that we hear um, feedback from staff and all of our stakeholders so that we can get a really accurate picture of some uh, ways that we can improve the system or recommendations to work towards. So thank you. I would like to thank Mr. Trenum and Ms. Williams for stepping up to do this. This was uh, an idea that the board had voted on in the budget prior to me joining the board. And so I look forward to hearing the results of your research. Thank you. Please vote. Vote to say yes, unanimous, motion passed. Next, we'll be moving on to 1802, Amendment of the Charter, Prince William County School Board Infrastructure Task Force. Um, this item I initially put on for action and then um, rethought the, that idea and put it back on just for discussion and for information. Uh, one of my concerns, which is voiced by many community members and is a uh, continual problem here in the county, is the overdevelopment, overcrowding, large classroom sizes. And so as I stepped onto the board, one of my concerns is how do we best address this? And in spending my time orienting to how the school board works um, and how the system works to address these issues, there are a number of avenues that the school board chooses to address these issues. One is setting up task force. We have an infrastructure task force. We have a joint task force on the CIP. And I spent some time trying to learn how these things work. Um, I was concerned in the infrastructure task force that the focus is, is very narrow and it doesn't address the infrastructure needs um, as far as overcrowding. So I thought one idea to further address that would be to consider revising the charter and adding more to the scope. I've gotten feedback that that would can add considerable work to that committee, and so I'm asking for sort of the public to reach out to me over the summer and board members to talk to me about how best we can do this. This committee actually sunsets at, um, in December, and so there may be uh, a new committee appointed with a different task. And so ideas and thoughts about this, this is an issue that I feel very, fairly strongly about. I believe that um, you know, besides improving a teacher pay, I think it's also important to improve the conditions they work with. And reducing overcrowded classrooms is, is an important priority, I think, for the division as a whole. And so I put this on there for the public to sort of look at, think about. I, I may have the wrong approach completely, um, and I'm, I'm happy to hear that back. Um, interested in, in hearing what people say. So this is more of, please reach out to me. Um, if you have thoughts and ideas, I want to consider this issue very strongly. And I'll take uh, comments from Mr. Trenum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first off, I want to clarify one thing, and uh, and just uh, uh, for the general general discussion, is uh, this afternoon I uh, spoke with uh, Mr. Latif on the phone, and he actually apologized to me for putting this on for action when the other things weren't. And one of the reasons why he moved that from action to discussion, discussion was to be consistent with the, uh, the items that I had put on. So I want to thank you for that, Mr. Latif. It shows a, a ge very gentlemanly um, action there, and I appreciate that. Um, as far as the intentions, I, I, I see where you're coming from. I think, the, to, I think it, it, it's helpful to, on the, to discuss the context of how the infrastructure came about. Um, I know, Ms. Williams, you were very involved when you originally had the discussion, and the, real, the original discussion behind the, the infrastructure task force was because we were, seeing, we were getting a lot of uh, concerns and complaints from the community about the differences that we were seeing between our new, new schools and our old, older schools. Um, having, uh, at the time, I had 
Patriot High School was the newest high school. Well, I think Colgan, I don't know if Col Colgan hadn't opened by then. Patriot High School was the newest high school in the county, and three miles down the road was the uh, was Brinsville High School, which was the oldest high school in the county. And um, having students that attended Brinsville, I heard about that every a lot every day. Um, but that said. It, Princeton's a wonderful school. My kids have had a great education, and congratulations, Walker. I graduated my baby this year. So, but anyway, so that's how the infrastructure ta task force came about, was to look at those differences between the newer and the older schools. Um, we, it was, the task force kind of self-organized and developed its own charter, and they uh, decided to focus first year on the elementary schools. Um, we got a series of recommendations out of those last December, which I think was wonderful because we actually used that and took action on it and leveraged that in the budget process this year. Um, so I think it was very helpful. And this year they're focusing on the middle schools and the high schools. I think keeping the scope narrow has allowed them in a two-year period to actually focus on something and get the task done. I agree with you that there may be uh, a need for a some sort of task force or community organization to look at uh, overcrowding issues, but I would say it either it should come, if we want to leverage the infrastructure task force, let them finish this job first and then move on um, because with overcrowding, dealing with overcrowding in a large scope, it really has, there's two ways you deal with it. Build more seats and you can look at reboundering. Um, and so in order for a task force to, to really be able to do that, they have to, they have to learn about our, the way we do our projections, the way we do our boundaries, um, how we do our budgeting, our CIPs, the impact on the, the, the impact of the debt service um, on the AAA bond rating. How that, there's a lot of stuff that goes into that. So I think I would, my preference would be I would like for, the, for them to finish up, uh, finish up this task first before we dive into something like that. This was also based on the, uh, it was also based on the model for our Safe Schools, Safe Schools Advisory Council. It was originally a Safe Schools Task Force. They came up with the initial set of ideas, and then that morphed into a standing committee. I'm not saying this would have to morph into a standing committee, but that's what that did to look at some other issues. But it was, uh, at first, a very focused uh, effort over a finite amount of time, which allowed it to be successful. So I think, from, that, from my perspective, I would like to, I, I think the ideas have merit, but I would like to see at least this group be able to finish what they've started going forward. Ms. Jesse. Um, I, I would like to also make comments about the infrastructure task force as we look at the um, in a, uh, overcrowding. I just want to remind uh, members of the board and also to the staff that when we look at class size reduction, again, I repeat myself because it's so important that when we give a teach, give a school another teacher and that school which is part of the class size reduction and that school has no space to put a teacher is is kind of it creates a situation for us so I would and the BOC we're on that committee that committee is meeting next week and I'm not sure that I think we do need to look at some some task force that is our task force, not a combined task force, to look at overcrowding on our own because I'm not sure that um, just the BOC itself can take care of situations in our school system because as Mr. Trenum says that there are many items that you really need to look at. You, you really do look at boundary situations and when I get the portable trailer report and I look at capacity levels, uh, that capacity level can be dealt with with the addition of a school or and, and a, uh, you can add additions to, to the school or it may be a boundary situation. So I do think it's something that really needs to be addressed because we cannot continue to say that we're always going to have trailers. And since uh, someone from risk management is in here, I think we one of the task force members sent an email, and all, so I chatted with her today, that we de we looked at the outside entrance and securing the outside entrance. We really do need to look at the structure security for trailers because uh, 
when you have lots of trailers or many trailers, a person does have access to those trailers. And there are school divisions that have large numbers of trailers that have looked at fencing. And I'm not telling you how to do it, but I think as we look at security of our schools, that where we, until we solve the problem, that is something that we need to look at. And perhaps another type of uh, uh, committee or task force could address that. But thank you for all that you've done. And I wanted to also correct something that uh, one of the parents called me with today to say that uh, Stonewall lost something because of the Woodbridge situation, but Stonewall did have its feel, and Woodbridge is going to get the feel. And I know that we're looking at all of those schools on that Eastern Corridor or wherever we have um, infrastructure situation that we need to deal with. I think it should be something internal. Thank you. Um, I'll go with I think, uh, Allison and then Lori. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, we have, we have had this addressed, um, having a plan to reduce overcrowding, to reduce class sizes, and to catch us up. And, you know, Mr. Chairman, you might not have been aware of this because it was last year as part of the fiscal year 2018 budget, but Dr. Waltz gave us a really good plan in the supplemental budget in fiscal year 2018, a five-year plan, and it was excellent. Um, there have been discussions with the Board of County Supervisors. Mr. Principe made some suggestions last year about possibly making it a 10-year plan. Uh, Mr. Canlin was making a suggestion this year about possibly having a 10-year school levy. So the Board of County Supervisors is interested in doing this. This plan would catch us up. Um, it's an expedited five-year plan, class size reduction, elimination of trailers, also focusing on closing the achievement gap, um, compliance, and there were some other budget priorities too. Some of those things we've addressed. But it's an expedited building plan and to get our kids in classrooms, to build those classrooms to accommodate our students and also work on reducing class sizes to, I believe it was 2005 standards, Dr. Waltz, if I remember correctly, something like that. And so, you know, we have something. So I think we need to continue to work with the Board of County Supervisors on how to pay for this. I'd love to see it happen. I think our citizens want to see something like this happen. And as Mr. Trenum referenced, we also have to keep in mind, and, on, and it was mentioned in citizen comment time, we also have to keep in mind the, the AAA budget rating and what the county spends, what we spend, it all works together. So we have to be very careful and thoughtful in how we spend. Um, we have the joint committee with the Board of County Supervisors. We've had some joint meetings with the Board of County Supervisors board to board. And I think we need to continue those conversations. We definitely need to hear from citizens. Is this something you're interested in, having us do an expedited plan where we do build more schools very quickly and get our kids out of trailers, reduce the class sizes at an expedited level? I want to see it happen. I think it would be great for students. It's, it's a big matter of how we're going to pay for it. And that's what everybody needs to come to the table with. Our citizens, the Board of County Supervisors, and us, how do we pay for it? As, as everybody probably realizes, we do not raise taxes as a board. We are dependent on funding from our community and from our Board of County Supervisors in the state. So I'd like to see that continue. Um, as for the infrastructure task force, um, I was talking to Mr. Richardson last night. They only have three meetings remaining in September, October, and November. And they're still focusing on finishing up visiting middle schools and high schools, including Woodbridge High School. I believe that's on the schedule for September. So I would really like to see them finish what they've started. They're 18 months into this. We're almost done. We'll have a report from them in December. Um, I want to see this completed so we can get those recommendations just like we did for elementary school and find out where the, where the areas are that we do need to catch up um, and help our schools to have more equal um, facilities, other things that they brought to us like school security and school safety. Um, other comments? And so, you know, that's, th those, are, those are my biggest concerns. I think we have the plan. It's just a matter of funding it. Um, I do appreciate you taking this off for action tonight because this is something I think we need to continue to work on as far as um, the plan that Dr. Waltz has already given us. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Williams. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually like this idea a lot. I think that we should continue with the infrastructure tax force and, um, not have it end in, in uh, December as it is scheduled to do so now. Um, I also, um, being that I sit on the joint uh, 
committee, I recognize that there's a lot of things that still need to be discussed. It's not just as simple as a, a plan. There are some other things that deal with equity, that deal with facility and nature that need to be addressed and really thoroughly discussed. It's not just a matter of coming up with um, dollars for an existing plan because some, some pieces of those plans aren't working, gonna work for the long term. We can't keep adding wings on schools and not not adding cafeteria space or gym space or, um, you know, our students are getting bigger. The, the, the way we educate students is changing. So I think that there's a lot of things that need to be discussed um, in addition to funding. Um, I think the supplemental plan is absolutely wonderful. I don't, I don't have any critique of those things, but I don't think we're close to um, an, a resolution on how to get it done, and I think there's still a lot of opinions out there floating around. Um, just as you mentioned, you know, you have like the Canlin tax and Prince of B's idea. There's a lot of discussion out there that still had to be made, and after sitting on the joint task force for after a year and um, not having all members come to to be able to vote and take action on things, that there's a roadblock even with that committee. So. I think that there's still things that need to be discussed and looked at, and I, I just don't see any downside to adding uh, to this equation or continuing this task force and expanding its mission after, uh, I do agree with, with Mr. Trenum, I think they should be able to finish what they've started because they're so close to the end point, but I, I think it needs to continue. All good points, I appreciate it. I'll appreciate feedback from the public, members of the committees, thank you so much. We'll move on next to, oh, uh, Mr. Deutsch. Sorry. Uh, I appreciate a number of the comments that have been stated so far. I think one of the important reasons why we shouldn't be amending the charter right now is that we um, we actually made a, a really big ask of the people that we picked for the committee. Um, we asked them to come on for a specific purpose, and we asked them to make sure they were free for two years um, to be able to do the, the work that was involved. Um, we also picked people for the focus of dealing with the inequities in facilities. Um, and I know a number of picks were... Uh, related to making sure we had people who had experience with older schools uh, and were more intimately aware of what was going on there. Uh, so I think if uh, essentially this task force were to be revived in a new form um, that we allow um, some, we allow people to pick new members, um, we, we have kind of a clean break um, to, a lot of these members have done a, a really a Herculean job, um, we're gonna need a breather. Uh, and uh, allow for us to pick a new set of people with specializations um, for whatever scope that we define. Thank you. Um, we're moving on next to 18.03, discussion of proposed changes to Regulation 6011, instructional objectives. Uh, Mr. Trenum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first off, uh, let me say that uh, um, uh, over the last several months, I've been talking about this in uh, Board Matters time and stuff like that as far as looking for ideas and looking for ways that we can do things to improve, improve, uh, improve the general, uh, do things that would help our staff as far as from a morale perspective, um, little things that aren't necessarily high dollar uh, things, but things that you can just make, the, the little difference that makes that can turn somebody's day from a, oh God, I gotta go through this again, to okay, this is okay or this is good types of things. Um, and the example actually I, I, I use is the superintendent's um, decision last uh, fall to allow for our staff to take time off um, either at the beginning or the end of the day without having to charge leave for it just to go to a, a, a meeting like a, a, a parent teacher meeting or something like that. Was, I thought that was a, 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 a great idea. Um, I actually, I did have someone come to me and say, well, you know what, it's not equitable because not all kids, not everybody has, has uh, children in schools that it can take advantage of. And my point was, I get not everybody can take advantage of it, but it's something that helps, you know, some people, and we can't do everything that makes good for everybody, but we can do some things that are low impact to the school of itself, but has a high impact on that, on that one individual's uh, uh, life. So I started talking about that. And so this is kind of where, I, where this all got started. Um, you see there's a number of uh, items on the list here uh, that I talked about. These all came out of conversations with uh, our various staff members. Um, these aren't 
these aren't my ideas. I, I don't, well, the last one that's kind of screwy, it, it, I'll take credit for the screwy ones. Uh, but uh, the, the rest of those are, are ideas that other people from, our, from within this, our, our staff members have come up to me at, at various events and said, hey, have you thought about this? Or this would, make it, this would really help me or, or help an impact and stuff like that. So that's kind of where all this came from. Uh, the last thing I wanted to just talk about as far as uh, the, there was some concern about whether these are action or, or discussion items, I did ask that they put on for action. The reason why I do that is just because as a board it gives us flexibility. Uh, we can talk about things and I always have always put on things for info action. That way if we talk about them and as a board we decide to say, hey, we like this, we want to do it, we can do it. Or if a board says, you know what, we think this has some possibilities but we would like the superintendent to go look at it and come back, we can do that, or we can just discuss as the board said, no, nah, we don't think it's going to go anywhere and just be done with it. So I'm not, so I, 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 I didn't want to get hung up over the, uh, the action uh, item piece. And part of this is coming from reflection on my own. Also, I realized that these are all regulations, so the superintendent actually can make all these changes without any discussion or any vote at all if he chooses to. Um, and the superintendent's good about reading the tea leaves and, and sensing, the, sensing the, the will of the board on those, those types of things. Um, so, so anyway. Well, um, well, why don't we just have you go to then HL4, sure. would you, uh, discussion of proposed changes? Through, sure, if you want to, as, okay. as you go through them. So the first one was regulation 601-1. Basically, my recommendation was that we have the superintendent take that back and relook at the, I did get all the board members have a packet of the current regulations that are there, if you're interested in reading it. The current regulation 601-1 is on instruction, um, and it's uh, it's just outdated. Um, it, it needs to be updated, um, and I I think this is probably just an, an administrative action or oversight that needs to be done. But the reason why I like this one um, was Ms. Jesse, it's, it's about instruction, and I will give you credit. I always sit here and say that the most important this budget this this board does is approve a budget, but the most important thing we do as a school division is instruction. So, so um, to that end, uh, I, I was just saying, you know what, this is, this is an, uh, it's an instruction and, and a regulation on instruction. It's important. We should, I think it's good that we have it, but, we, but it definitely needs to be updated. And actually, as I was looking uh, along with this, this is instruction 601-1. There's an, a 601-2 and a 601-3 that all need to be updated. And we don't have a corresponding policy 601. So I'm thinking, but my thoughts are, as we are looking at the, relooking the 100 series instructions over the summer, maybe we should look at, do we need a policy 601 to go along with, to, go, to, line, to align these up with, updated policy. So that was, that was just my recommendation with those, is to look at those. That was the first one. The second one was the um, recommendation for changes to uh, regulation 562.02-1. Uh, that's certified workday personal and responsibilities. Um, this one, I think there's some there's some internal consistency that we need, and just some general maybe just discussion we need to have. Um, everybody's got a copy of the policy, and the um, but there's also the regu uh, the re regulation as well. In the 562 policy basically say a duty-free meal time shall be provided for all employees. Duty-free planning time shall be provided. Shalls. In our, in our regulations, in 562.02-1, 561.02-1, we have a section that says, um, says every effort shall be made to provide teachers with an unencumbered, unencumbered lunch, lunch period. Every effort will be made to minimize the number of required night meetings for teachers, et cetera. So we talk about every effort. The policy says shall. Our regulation says, says we'll make some effort. So I think we need to, if our, if our policy is going to be shall, which is directive in nature, then we need to redirect our staff to make sure, you know, look at what will it take to make it a shall. If making it a shall is too too much of a stretch, then maybe we need to go back and update our policy. Um, but I think it, we, should, uh, we should really try to uh, at least look at what does it take to make, a, make the shalls a shall. Mm -hmm. So. Could I add something? Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> in looking at the regulation, uh, the workday, um, uh, the role of uh, principals and the role of teachers has changed drastically. Uh, 
when there was a time as a principal when you came into an interview situ situation, there were three questions, mostly about discipline, your philosophy of education, and whether or not you could get along with parents. And that was it. If you had a school with good discipline, you got along with parents, that was it. Things changed in the 70s. <clears throat> the responsibilities for principals and the responsibilities um, for teachers expanded. It was different, but it was also an addition so that principals now have responsibility of not just the administration, but instruction. At the end of the day, it is about instruction. It's like a hospital. At the end of the day, it's about the patients. Uh, but I think what um, I would like to just hear, tell you what I have been hearing uh, for just consideration down the road is that um, I don't hear much about the lunch time unencumbered, but I, I do hear a lot about the planning time. And as a school system, because we are one of the few school divisions that provide that planning time on a daily basis, we have more planning than most people in the country. I've done some work on that. But I think what I'm hearing is that um, during that planning time, uh, other meetings unrelated to planning are taking place. Um, now, when you think about planning and following monitoring instruction, during that five-day period, there has to be time uh, at, at, at our school, for example, the teachers just voted that they who have three days of collaborative planning, uh, one day to talk about monitoring instruction with the principal, and then they said, well, I just want one day by myself. I don't want to talk to anybody. I just want to be in my room and have time to just relax. So I think every school has different things, but I do think that we need to look at what's happening during that um, instructional planning time, that maybe there are people who are um, using that time for things other than talking about instruction that is like, I want to have a meeting and I'm pulling you out. I think we need to probably look at that and monitor that. And I don't know how we sure that up, but I just wanted to share that I've heard some, that's what I have heard as, as a member of the board and having been in the school, and I think that's why it comes to me. Thank you. Ms. Williams. Um, thank you, Mr. Turner, for bringing this up. I have a question for the superintendent. I know that the, we're in the you're in the process of reviewing all of these um, policies and regulations. And is this particular series or set anywhere close to that? I know that there's a cycle that the uh, staff go through. And then I have one more follow-up to that. Depending upon the regulation and the policy, there are some that are literally updated on a yearly basis if there's any change in the law. Um, outside of that, there may be some other reasons that compel us to have them on a review cycle that may be two years, or, but normally it's a, a three, four, or five year re review cycle. Okay. Now, part of what we've done is, uh, I remember a famous night where we were, uh, we used to have a separate policy night, a separate school board meeting once a month. Mm. And, um, that was before my time. Yes, it so. was. And it had a subcommittee. And um, again, I, I don't normally talk about my doctorate, but it is in policy, educational policy and leadership. And so I said that I thought my policy uh, professors would probably croak at the University of Maryland because what I did is I had them wheel over the printed out copies of all the policies all the regulations, and then we had operating procedures manuals. And it was a stack that completely blocked my ability to see the board members to my left. And basically what I said is, you know, a, a policy should be a philosophy statement. It should say who's responsible for it, and it should say when it's going to be reviewed. A regulation is how is the administration going to implement the policies that were approved by the school board. The regulations should reflect the board's intention of the policies. Doesn't necessarily mean that the administration may fully support what the board did or not like it. It doesn't really matter. If the board has approved a policy, it's incumbent upon the administration to promulgate a, a, rep, a regulation that is aligned with that. 
So we had a, we are still, believe it or not, a decade later, trying to consolidate, and we basically have consolidated all of the daily operating procedures manuals into regulation. We have tried to separate what I believed were many contaminated policies that had policy and regulation in the same thing. We fixed much of that. What really remains is the 100 series, which is school board, which we're going to take that on with the board support this summer, and there are still some outdated policies. All of that being said, something like this, you know, we can look at a regulation at any time. So whether it's on cycle or not. So for example, the shall, and then looking at the regulation, uh, some of these things, you know, you can split hairs. Sometimes people feel very strongly, if I'm having a planning time, that means nobody is influencing that time. That is my time by myself in my classroom. Well, there may be other schools that thought where, well, part of planning time is co-planning. And so what we really expect is that uh, school principals have conversations with their building instructional team leaders and try to work through those things so we don't necessarily prescribe each and every school and how that's going to be done. But something like this, again, we're, we're happy to take a look at it, no problem. Okay, you want to move on to the next one, Gil? Yeah. Oh, oh, go ahead. Sure, thank you. So the next one was the um, discussion to propose change to Regulation 542.05-1. Um, this one was brought to me by, uh, by a teacher uh, based on uh, experiences they had. And like I said, it was just one of those little frustrating things. Um, so basically what, the, what, the, my, proposal do, what my proposal does is it just adds in language that um, st stipulates that for uh, if uh, teachers are, if uh, staff is, is taking leave on a day that's been a, been reduced, uh, a reduced work day for whatever reason, whether it be the inclement weather, just a planned half day or whatever, that, or planned partial day, uh, early release, what have you, if, the, if they've got leave taken on a, a day that's less than the normal work day, they're just charged the amount of leave that that day would be. Um, so, so if, it, if, if the workday was reduced to a five and a half hour workday, they would get charged five and a half hours of leave. So it, just explain to me one more time, Gil, what the change would be. Sure, let me actually pull up the language. You may, you may have said it and I just didn't hear it right. Sure, the, so the, the language that I was proposing was that the Personal leave shall not be, uh, and the, this part is the same. So the only change is tack, I was tacking on to one section that says um, personal leave will be charged in 15 minute increments. If personal leave is taken for a full day that has been shortened in accordance with approved school calendar as a result of the delayed start, early closure, declined inclement weather, the employee will be only charged leave for the actual number of hours they would have worked on that day. And one, and one of the reasons why I, I thought that it would need to be put in the regulation because um, right now there's no, there's no place that our staff, our general staff, can go to look at and say, what am I going to be charged? It's, if, you want, if, you get, if you get ticked for that for a full seven hours a day and you ask about that, you have to call HR because it's not in the regulation telling, telling you what you're going to be uh, charged on that. So I think Dr. Waltz. Uh, okay, Dr. Waltz. So I would like to call uh, Ms. Sparks up, the Director of Benefits. If you can just, because there's a distinction with a difference, I think on, it depends on whether the employee is put in for advanced leave, plan to take the day, or uh, could you basically describe if there's a distinction with a difference with that? It doesn't mean we can't still look at it because we can, and also if there's any implications for Kronos, and is that something that is affecting that or that we need to look at as well, please. Uh, good evening, Dr. Latif, board members. Um, when it comes to this regulation, it is up for revision and review, and I am working on it. Uh, just so you know, all of, my, all of my leave regs are needing to be updated. But in this case, no, the regulation does not identify. Um, one of the things that um, you do have to know is that when it comes to this regulation on the two-hour delay, it covers certificated staff, 
TAs, library assistants, and bus drivers and bus drivers attendants. They only get one hour, the teachers get two. Everybody else is required to be at school on time. If they take, um, if it is a scheduled leave day, we do charge them for a full day. We have, um, we did it in 2015 and we did it again just this last week based on this. Uh, we went back out to all of the Region 4 again and asked them what they do. And we follow in the same lines as everyone that is around us. And that is they do charge for either the full day or the full ha or half day, depending on what it is. So if it's an early release in somebody, it's a, it's a half day. Now, when it does say in the regulation about the 15 minutes, so if somebody has a doctor's appointment and they're only going to need 15 or 30 minutes to take off, then we do let them only use 15 or 30 minutes. We don't make them take, which a lot of our neighbors do make them take either a half day or a whole day in that situation, and we do not. So this only comes into play on the delayed openings. And this year we had four, which was not normal. I was going to, both, I guess, one thing I was going to ask you, uh, Gil, personal days, were you thinking sick days too or just personal days? So if I'm, if I take a sick day, I lose, if, even if it's a two hour delay, I lose my whole sick day. We do treat sick days the same as we do personal days, just so you know. Okay. So that, that would be just something I would look at too. Uh, I, I like what you're doing with this, but I, I would also, my thought would be looking at sick days with that same type of conversion too. And that one's also looking to be revised also. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, you wanna move on to the next one, Gil? Sure, I can move on to the next one. Thank you. Um, see, the next one was the proposed regulation tuition 346-1. Um, first off, I, I do want to uh, uh, thank the, super, the superintendent and staff for cha changing the uh, regulation. Or the, the change to 25% came earlier in the year. Um, this actually came, this discussion came out of uh, two different conversations. Um, my recommendation was to, uh, uh, to, in, to increase the overall tuition discount to 50% uh, from the 25%. And then the other one was to add in a clause for uh, some extreme medical conditions related to, related to students. Um, like I said, both of, the, both of these aspects came out of conversations with two different, from two different people. Um, the first one, as far as the 50%, I had a, a teacher came up to me at a School of Excellence celebration and said, you know what, it would be great if we could, do, if we could increase, if we could just completely waive tuition for, for, our, uh, for our staff. Um, because especially for like teachers assistants or bus drivers or the secretaries that don't make as much, the 10% the, at the time, the 10%, the 10% discount just it didn't help them any. Um, so my thought was, I like the idea of being able to have our staff's children attend Prince William County schools, even if, even if they don't reside within the county. I think it, that increases their personal investment in the su success of the school division. Um, I did ask about the cost associated, uh, well, the, the cost tuitions, you know, just slightly over $6,000 the coming year uh, for, uh, for an in-state resident. Um, so I, I asked about the number of employees th th that we actually have taking advantage of this. Right now, or as, in, as of February, when I first started talking about this, there were 11 employees in the entire county that were actually using the discount. So um, right now, what we're talking about with the 25 with a 25% discount, we're really talking about like $17,000 and change of lost revenue uh, over uh, over the entire budget. And then if you up that to 50%, then you're talking like another $17,000. Like I said, this doesn't affect a lot of people, but for the people that it does affect, it can impact them significantly. So it's the, the, that whole concept of Try and do some things that don't cost a lot of money, but that can make it big impacts to, to, to some people. Um, the other thing is I looked at, I didn't look at everybody around there, but I did look at a couple other school divisions. Stafford and Fauquier County allow for employees to come in completely with uh, children with, with no tuition. It's waived. So it's not, it's not inconsistent with what some other school divisions are doing. Dr. Waltz. I, I would just like to give uh, Mr. Klein, since 
this is his last <laughs> shot to weigh in. Um, <clears throat> and and uh, again, we we can sir, we can do this. We we'll do anything the board asks us to do. Um, we initiate many things that the, even the board doesn't ask us to do that we think are good for employees. Um, I guess part of my concern is. Um, I've heard from a number of fiscal conservatives as recently as this past budget cycle about something as simple as trying to help uh, low-income families with the before and after care and why in the world are we subsidizing, you know, that. So again, I'm, I'm not suggesting that I'm even weighing in on one side or the other, but I know there's a strong group of people that look at this stuff and also, I would just like, uh, Mr. Klein, if, if there are other, any, any other things you've thought about that we should consider as we take a look at this. And again, we're happy to look at it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Waltz, just, just to follow up on a couple items, and certainly at this point, relative to saying that there are 11 teachers that are doing it, certainly any reduction in that cost is going to increase the number, not decrease it. I think uh, a part of the discussion is as much philosophical on the one hand that we're providing a benefit to people who live outside the county and who do not pay taxes in the county as opposed to those who live in the county and do pay taxes. As, as it ties into some of the other discussions, again, it's not big numbers, but we're having discussions tonight about what well, we need, we potentially need to uh, address the CIP, add more classroom spaces, and yet we take steps that are increasing the number of students that are our building. Not that it's a big number, but it's as much sort of the, the philosophically. Uh, it, it, at the same time, I think we've got, uh, we had it for building. We have discussions of rezoning saying, well, we don't want to have rezonings. We don't want to add kids. That side of it impacts us. The other one is to the extent that this takes place, it's a subsidy of those teachers by Prince William County taxpayers. Is, is that, in fact, what we want to be advertising? at a point in time in which potentially we're talking about wanting to go back to the supervisors and say, we need substantial different additional monies to address other issues. No, it's not big numbers, but I, but I think it, it, it's worthy of the discussion to say that philosophically, it does open us up to potential criticism for, well, you're, you're giving away something here, and then you're coming back and you're asking for something more on another side. Um, the, the other circumstances of I think a student tied to a specific individual case, potentially if we have a case where there's sort of the 100% reimbursement, I would have a concern potentially relative to the risk side or the, the, the valuation may be substantially higher if it's associated with special needs students as opposed to a regular student who's, I mean, the dollar amount's driven not just by uh, a cost for regular student Cost, but it would also be driven by any additional costs associated with special needs or potentially changes our risk. Again, they're, they're minimal relative to the size of the organization. But I think those would be things that we'd want to, in one sense, want to think about doing. At the same time, yes, it's nice that we're being recognized that potentially people want their kids to be coming here. Uh, on the other hand, people who are living in outer counties and moving and coming here are also coming here because we have higher salaries. It's the, I want to live further out. I want to have, to some extent, I don't want the, the, some of the issues potentially of the higher costs or potentially traffic and things in Prince William County. I want to live out in a rural community, but then I want to come have all the benefits of Prince William County. So those are just some things to take for consideration. Um, I'll go to Dr. Waltz. Just one last quick comment, and, and that would be, if this is something that you're really proposing, I do think it would be better to come forward as a proposed policy and let the board make a decision on that, and then we can put together the regulation if that's the will of the board. Uh, uh, Ms. Williams. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, um, as someone who lives, 25 miles from where I work. That's why, it's because I clearly cannot afford to live in the city. It's getting more expensive by the year to live in Prince William. Um, but you weigh the cost of where you work versus where you live. Um, I think that, in theory, this is a good proposal. Um, 
because I think it, it does provide another avenue to support our teachers and, and, and it provides support, I would be uh, much more interested instead of a blanket discount to do something on a sliding scale. Um, like, for example, the salary difference between a bus driver and a uh, step, I'm making it up, 11 teacher, the impact of that 25% is extreme. So to me, I think it, it would be more beneficial to the people at the lower end of the scale. I'm not saying that if you're on the higher end, it's not a benefit in any way you can save dollars is always a benefit. I'm sure you'll agree, Mr. Turner, with that. Um, but as someone who's uh, experienced both, well, I haven't really been on the top end yet, so maybe one day I'll find that out. But anyway, it, I know from sliding scale, daycare payments and things like that, a lot of institutions do that based upon your income to try to help support families who need it the most. And I'm wondering if maybe that's something that can be looked at as opposed to just a blanket. I don't know if it's even worth reviewing, but I think that that may be something that would really boost the morale for the people who really need it. And maybe that's why they work here and live so far away is, you know, for example, daycare is outrageous. It's like this cost of sending your child to daycare is sending them to college. The same for preschool. So I can only imagine as a bus driver the benefit of having to have, be able to have your student close to you. You save on daycare. You save on so much. And then you're, you know, if you're a fresh new hire, you're probably making the least. So I think that would be most impactful to the people who really need it and, and boost the morale where it really matters. I think not to say that it doesn't matter at the top end, but... Definitely, if there's a choice between putting gas in your car, taking your kid somewhere, eating dinner, those kind of decisions, that this would really pay, play into that effectively, I think. So I, I like where it started. I'm glad the superintendent made the 25% um, percent reduction. But I think if we're going to do it, maybe it's worth considering looking at a sliding scale for those who need it most. Uh, who's, is it Lily? I, uh, one of the, uh, it's just a, for observation, uh, if you're on that 95 corridor, um, there are people who moved to Stafford County, and that was always an issue for me, but I had about seven or eight daycare centers, and I'm just not part of the policy, but somewhere, I know that you probably do this, but just uh, perhaps a little bit more emphasis with the daycare providers and the daycare centers. I found that the daycare centers always wanted the clients, and the clients lived uh, in Stafford and would drop their kids off at daycare centers, and many did not know that they would have to pay tuition. So I just wanted to just bring that to your attention because often I had to have risk management, follow people home, uh, because what parents don't know is that fifth graders will always say we bought a new house and the house is in Stafford. And so I think we lose money on that end. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Thank you. Yeah. Justin? Yeah. Uh, about this one, and I apologize, I might want to go back and ask Ms. Sparks a question about the last one too. So if that's okay. But about this one, um, I. I'm open, I like the idea and merit. Um, I actually disagree about more of the progressive sliding scale. Um, I'd be willing to more inch up, not 50, but look at a kind of a, a compromise somewhere in like 35 or something, something I'd be open to discussing to give the additional incentive to help uh, families. Um, but I do agree with like what Ms. Williams said, we make a choice where we live. You know, I could, I live in Prince William, I send my kids to Prince William schools. I could get probably the same size home, probably $100,000 cheaper in Stafford, but my kids go to Prince William County Schools. But I do believe in providing that additional help for the people who might want to have the option of having their kids go to school. So that's definitely something I, I, I would be open to discussing. Can I have Ms. Sparks real quick for a quick second? Because I thought it would be more appropriate to ask this one later, but then I was like, personnel versus classified. Mr. Klein, yeah, go, goodbye, Mr. Klein. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just <laughs> one more time, huh? Quick question, I should have asked this about the, uh, the, the hours, uh, the allotment of what we were talking about, personal days and, um, and, um, and uh, sick days. Classified and uh, teachers, those scales, the various scales about that, they all get three personal days a year, correct? Yes. 
Okay, so one thing, and I just want to add to this discussion, maybe we can talk more about it since this was discussion, Gil, and we can talk more over the summer. Um, I hear a lot from classified um, staff about this uh, in particular is, although I do support the idea of site-based with the flex days when it comes to teachers, uh, I was a teacher and I had principals who said, you must be there for those three additional flex days. And I had others who said, if you end your year early and you've been going to all these other meetings, you're good to go. I don't have a problem with that. My issue is a lot of classified who have longer contracts don't really have that flexibility. And so one thing I'd be open to considering instead of three, maybe four personal days or something like that to give them that additional day because they don't have the flexibility of having a principal say, you know, you finished out the year, you don't have to come in. Whereas I had another principal who did make me come in and I watched lots of movies those three days when summer break was beginning. So it's a variation, it's a trade off, but just something, I don't know if, have you guys heard from Classified about this? Yes, I actually uh, chair an employee benefits committee. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about the regulations in that employee benefit committee. And that committee consists of classified employees. It consists of teachers and administrators. And so we do talk about, and they have asked repeatedly, and also even some on the advisory councils, can we, instead of uh, sickly rolling over, and now nothing, this is just what they're asking. Uh, instead of it rolling over into sick leave, can we keep, if I've got two days, if I've got three days, can I keep two of those so that I could actually have five days? You know, so. But that still keeps them at three a year. I get, that's a nice three, benefit, so. But they, 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 have, they have brainstormed some of the things. And so as I rewrite and revise, then I'll be putting together things that they will either approve or disprove. Okay, that's good. Thank you. I just wanted to throw it out there as something yeah, I was thinking. I've heard a lot about this from classified staff oh, yes. since we're talking about this. Okay. Trust me, I hear it too. Okay, oh, thank you. And I'm sorry I went back, Dr. Latif. No worries. Uh, I think we'll go to Willie was next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> I, I really appreciate the, the work and research that Mr. Trenum has done in compiling a number of these regulations and bring them forward. I think the impetus for this is the fact that statistically, um, school employees do not believe that central office departments understand their school needs. And I think this is a result of uh, these efforts here with these regulations are to try to uh, work to uh, be responsive, uh, listen to teachers, listen to staff, and, uh, and change that dynamic. Uh, I guess as I listen to the discussion, um, we have an interesting line here on the school board of policies versus regulations. And it's our duty as a board to oversee the policies while the staff oversees the regulations. Uh, and what, what seemed to come through though is what counts is what? Uh, is very unclear and seems to be limiting the, uh, the school board's ability to oversee things. So uh, we've got one policy that's more narrow than the regulation is, which seems that the two would be contradictory. Then we have a regulation that exists where there is no policy, so there's no oversight. And then on the last one, uh, this regulation 346, with tuition, the tuition percentage is in the regulation, but then we just heard that to change that, we should do that by a policy. And I, sometime this line has to be cleared or, uh, or we're gonna, it's very challenging to continue to actually uh, guide and define things here in the division. And I, I think, just wrapping up, I think these are a number of regulations that would uh, are, are, have a lot of merit, uh, should have serious consideration. I've gotten numerous uh, follow-up from teachers, parents, uh, who are supportive of a number of the, these ideas, and I think they could represent a proactive way for the administration to uh, be more responsive uh, to teachers who keep moving forward. Dr. Wald. Dr. Wald. Well, I'd like to clarify the remark that you made because maybe I wasn't clear enough on having the board uh, look at a policy. 
what I meant by that is not to have them set out the specific amount of money, that type of thing. But again, a policy should be a f fairly short philosophical statement of the will of the board. So if you were going to have a policy like that, it would be something to the effect that for school division employees living outside of the boundaries of Prince William County Public Schools, the school board um, directs the administration to make it as easily financially accessible for their children to attend the schools. Something, a philosophical statement, not setting necessarily the exact amount, and then through the conversation that the board would have at a public meeting, those things usually become very clear, what it is that the will of the board, five or more members, would like it to be, and then we'll put together the regulation. Any more comments? Uh, Mr. I think Allison and then Mr. Trenum. Thank you, Ms. Jesse. Um, I'm going to go backwards since Justin did, or since Mr. Um, Wilkes did. Um, at Regulation 562.02-1, we're talking about duty-free meal time and planning time. And I just want to make a reference. Uh, Ms. Jesse said that she didn't hear a lot of people talking about lunch time, but she did about planning. Um, Dr. Wallace, I just want to mention to you, I have heard comments from several people about having lunch duties. And if we could add some consistency on what we're supposed to be doing and what we're not supposed to be doing at our schools so that we have consistency, I think that would greatly help, especially with morale, with teachers to actually be able to have a lunch break. And I'm hearing a lot of concern about um, that. And then um, going back to Regulation 346-1, tuition, I'm concerned about the 50%. I like what Mr. Wilkes said about coming up with a compromise amount. I think that's a better idea. Um, and as Mr. Klein said, if we do change the percentage, we will have more people taking advantage of it. We're getting into cost, and how do we budget? I'm concerned about that. Mr. Klein mentioned something about, well, we're talking about we are concerned about new building because we don't have space available. You know, if we go in this direction, I would like to add a clause that if space is available in the school, because we do have schools that are severely overcrowded. And as a board, we have made a statement in our statements to developments that we don't want to add more students to the school. So we have to be careful and we have to be consistent or we're going to get into trouble. So I think that's something we need to consider also. I like the idea of helping our families. Um, um, another consideration, something we might want to think about. One, one of the comments I heard on this one was from families who live in the county who wouldn't be benefiting from this. And they're like, okay, I don't want to be unfair to parents who need this because this is a huge financial amount of money, but what about those of us who live in the county who work here? What are you going to do to help us? And so one of my thoughts in that direction, slightly off topic, healthcare, our healthcare costs continue to skyrocket. And this is more expensive. Is there a way we could take a little bit more off the top of and this is just suggestion, possibility, something to consider, is there a way we could take a little bit more off the top of what our employees are paying into health care? Because that could benefit everybody. It's like, for example, for example, this year we know that our costs as a division are going up 6%, our employee costs are going up 6%. Our pay this year, we have the step increase with an average of 2.7%. So once everybody starts looking at their paychecks, they might not see a difference. And that's a great concern to me. And so I'd like to also look at ways that we can make a really strong impact for all of our employees. And like I said, I know that's a cost, and I don't know exactly what we're getting into. And Ms. Sparks, that's something I guess we'll have to continue conversation on with Dr. Waltz, who I know has just stepped out, and I'll repeat that to him later on. But I'd like to see us look at things like that, too, that can impact all of our employees. Um, but um, also in payments, um, we had someone mention today about the payments and can we break it down. Someone came to me saying that they, were, they had two payments, one at the beginning of the year, one halfway through the year for tuition. I don't know if all of our families who are living outside the county who are paying tuition, I don't know if all of them are aware that they could ask to have those payments broken down. If we could possibly uh, work with our families to give them the option to break it down. Um, and have those tuition payments spread out through the year, I think that would be a great benefit to our families too. And it's not quite as much a hardship as having those big lump sums two times a year. And I think that would be greatly appreciated. 
Thank you. Mr. Trenum. Uh, Mr. Trenum. Sure, thank you. The last point I want to make on this is just to not to forget the other half, the part about the medical exemption. I would like us to see us if possible do something about that. And that came actually from a specific specific uh, uh, instance where a couple of our uh, a couple of our staff members um, that resided out of the county uh, but were teachers in, 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 at different schools had a student and and I have just so for our attorneys I have made sure that they are comfortable with me talking a little bit about their situation um, and that their student had a medical condition uh, that essentially a heart condition that could cause, that uh, called prolonged QT that could cause their heart to stop with sudden loud noises. So they had a medical, their medical doctor said, it would really, really be good for you if you could have at least one of you on the premises with this child because the child has to carry a defibrillator with them. So um, that, to, to that extent, that create that does create a, a financial burden, and I get I get you know life's not fair, and some people have extra financial financial burdens, but they were actually at the, at that point in time looking do we do we have to you know can we both stay in Prince William County do we need to to move or does one of us need to move to look out to find options to be able to afford this, and so I would like for I would like for us to see something along those lines to encourage uh, the administration to uh, to. Either use more dis leverage discretion that they have more, or put something in writing to help cover those situations in more detail. Ex excellent thoughts, everyone. Um, I think. Uh, okay, we'll move to eighteen oh eight, and let's try to stick to the topic on the the agenda. If so, we're off. We're going to eighteen oh eight. No wait. I'm sorry, eighteen oh seven. The, the plan to eliminate interim reports, Mr. Trenum. Okay, so we're off. We're off of uh, specific regulations. So. Uh, which makes it maybe easier and quicker to discuss. But so this came, this one came also, like I said, conversations from a number of teachers, especially, actually this one is especially from our special education teachers. I know there are legal requirements that we got, have to meet, but the uh, interim process, um, it's something we've been, I think it's a carryover from before, and it does create an, to a certain degree an administrative burden on our staff. Um, I think there are, and like I said, especially our special education staff, but some other folks as well. To me, uh, from what I've been talking to people, the, um, the best argument against it that I've heard so far, well, aside from if there's any legal arguments re regarding you know, special education, because they're the ones that are impacted most, but one of the biggest arguments I've heard is, well, the, the interim process helps to make sure that our, uh, that you know, it helps to give us feedback as parents because it's, that's when the teachers make sure that the grades are entered in the grade book. Well, the, we've already got regulations that says the grades are supposed to be entered every week. And um, with our systems now, I think there, there have to be, there have to be, I think that's the, uh, uh, a crude hammer to use to enforce the grade in, uh, to enforce people that enforce that people have grades are entered in the system, doing an interim report that affects everybody across the board, generating all this work, I think is a is a awful big hammer to use. That I would think with our the systems we have now, we could automate this somewhat, and even to the point where automating the notification of people if they're not, you know, and, and helping to make sure that people do get in the grade book uh, grades entered in promptly, as opposed to like I said, just this one interim piece. Like I said, this goes back to this is similar to the discussion that we had a few years back regarding the orange books at elementary schools, and uh, that we were collecting a lot of data that weren't that uh, we we wound up realized we weren't using them uh, to the extent that uh, to justify all the work that was going into generating them. So we we did get rid of them, um, and it, to, to me it's a simple it's another similar type of effect. Is is this an administrative process that we can that we either using the technology that we have, we can either eliminate or restructure to help reduce the, the, the administrative burden on our staff. Uh, I'm gonna go to Ms. Williams first and then Dr. Waltz, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, sorry, Dr. Waltz. Um, in theory, this is probably a good idea in reducing teacher workload, but um, as a parent, I, and a board member, please never 
reduce, eliminate interim reports until we have a system that actually works correctly and well and is followed by everyone. Um, I can tell you as a parent, it is an annual discussion, and I'm sure Dr. Waltz's ear probably is ready to fall off every year um, with me going, I know there's a regulation that teachers are supposed to enter this into the gradebook once a week. Haven't had a year yet where that's happened effectively, and which is why I was so excited that we're getting rid of the current system and updating it. Um, I see AJ out there because you just one of my favorite people. Because my son has like almost lost several things close to his life based upon grades not being done correctly in Parent Portal. Um, and it's bad enough now that I have a high schooler and he's a good kid. And I don't really have any complaints other than now I must hawk the mailbox for the actual paper interim that comes in. And I could check Parent Portal and things like that. But I like to see the paper copy because he's ready to, that's the mail collection day he pays attention to. Um, Good grades or not. So I would be terrified as a parent to not get an interim um, just based upon my experience um, having my son through the school system. And I'm not saying it's every single teacher because clearly he doesn't have all of them. And I'm not saying it's not effective in some places. But right now as a parent, parent portal is enough to make me not check it. So um, that's just an honest perspective from one person. I'm sure it's not shared by all. I personally would like to see the new program that we budgeted and is coming forth um, be applied and then maybe relook at something like this. Because um, I think the idea of the new program was to kind of consolidate things and not have teachers have multiple entries and have a better way of tracking. And I see AJ over there shaking her head, so maybe she has some sort of further detailed, much better phrased and worded uh, summary on this program that I, as a parent, am so excited to get to. I can't even tell you, as someone starting all over again, to Mr. Turner with the kindergartner, so. Dr. Waltz. So I'll start with the orange folders. The state, when they discontinued having the fifth grade writing assessment, um, I will have to say that in foregoing and reducing tests, I'm all for that. These single shot things that we uh, have done to our kids throughout the country to me is over the top. At any rate, if they were going to cut back on things, cutting the fifth grade writing assessment, if, if anyone at the state level would have asked me, I would have been against that. Because that's the only time we evaluate writing now until grade eight formally through the state. So there was great concern about, you know, how can we assure that every single teacher is going to be preparing these students properly? So we collected pieces of authentic writing and other evidence when that test went away. However, I thought it became more than was necessary. So we talked to a number of teachers um, about their use, the preparation, what happened when they were handed off to middle school, whether people ever looked at them, et cetera. Make a long story short, we reduced dramatically what we required of them. You mentioned that you think it's sort of the same thing. That I'm not sure, but I will just say a note of caution for a few reasons, and then I'd like to hear uh, from um, the staff which we've had a very short amount of time to look at this. But of, of all the things that you suggested, this would be the thing that I would say would need the most consideration. Because for one thing, I think we need to do a massive survey of how parents would feel about it. Um, and to get the teacher input as well on it. And we'll give you a little bit of information about the automation and who gets it now and who has access and that sort of thing. So at a time when the school board is asking me to improve communication, this one makes me quite nervous. So uh, with that, I'll just let you, and again, this is very preliminary, uh, just I asked them if there was any information that they could share that would inform tonight's conversation, but we can certainly look at it more over time. All right. Thank you, uh, Chairman Latif, members of the board, Dr. Waltz. Uh, the area I want to discuss really comes down to unintended consequences of potentially moving too rapidly on this. We've heard the uh, discussion already a little bit of the parent portal and the gradebook. 
And the old-fashioned way of doing things might be considered to be the interim. And the technology represents the new way of doing things. The challenge that we have is Parent Portal currently has approximately 30,000 subscribers. Now, many of those subscribers may have multiple students, but nonetheless, what that's saying is we have a lot of people who are relying on that interim as their primary lifeline to see how their students are doing at specific periods of the year. Now, I will also agree with you, and, and we heard about the idea that we're going to have improved systems. One of the reasons that Parent Portal may not be too popular is it's an antiquated product. We also have a student management system that is not only antiquated, it's end of life, it is no longer supported by the vendor, and the board has seen fit to give us the finances to go forward with putting a new system in place beginning in August of 2019 so that we have it there for the 2019-20 school year. The challenge, if we were to act too quickly, is that we have people working day and night right now programming that system, getting it ready to be available to us more than a year from now. If we had to go back and first make our old system work with a new system that no longer used interims, they'd have to go back, they'd have to do reprogramming. I believe AJ will tell you they'd need to touch pretty much every school, and the amount of time taken for that would mean that preparing this new product to be ready would just not happen on time. It might be delayed two, three, four months. The problem with that, of course, is you don't want to introduce a brand new system two or three or four months into the school year, so the reality would be that we might have to push it back by an entire year. And I don't know that that's something you were anticipating. So this, as I said, is potentially an unintended consequence of moving too quickly. And if there are any more technical questions on that, Ms. Phillips can answer them. Gail? Sure, I don't know that I, have, well, from a technical perspective, I just want to say I appreciate you coming, getting rid of the obsolete systems right as I'm graduated out of them. <laughs> so, but that said, I, I think the technology is a, is a huge part of, uh, part of the uh, answer here. And like I said, this was to really to talk about, to prompt a conversation to talk, talk about a plan and how can, and be more proactive and communicative is how are we going to leverage our systems to help reduce and automate some of the administrative burden. Um, some of the people I've talked to that have asked about, like I said, on the enforcement piece, there are ways to automate that. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that we do this to our teachers, but uh, for me as a defense contractor, I have to enter my time uh, every, every day. Uh, if I don't do that, the system automatically kicks out an email and tells me that I didn't do it. And if I don't, still don't do it, then it kicks out an email and tells me and my supervisor that I didn't do it. So, that's just an example of the system, we can leverage the system to help automate some of that stuff and, 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 and help us improve our processes uh, without, without being overly burdensome and without having the staff to have to, to take care of, of all the administrative prospects of that. I mean, ideally a new system, in an ideal world, if we're going back to the theoretical, the, the interim report would actually be no more than an electronic dump of what's in the system. And it just goes out, and it goes out electronically to everybody that's signed up for electronic accounts. That would be ideal. That would be ideal. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Andrew? You know, the good evening, everyone. Um, the new system is going to be much more robust than what we currently have. Um, Will it be better for teachers as well? Yes. Okay. It's going to be better for teachers, for parents, for staff. I mean, it, overall, it's just a much more robust system. I guess tonight my concern was just mostly we only have 31,000 parents who are currently getting in our current parent portal. Yes, Ms. Williams is correct, probably because it's not very good. Um, so I anticipate that to go up with the new system. But if we were to implement this immediately, that would be one of my fears. And also, this system is end of life. I would hate to have us put money, time, and resources into a system that is going to be end of life and to do it immediately. So if, we're, if we could wait until implement with a new system, that would be my suggestion. So I, I wasn't here when you signed up the contract for the new system. I assume the new system is going to deliver what they say they're going to deliver. Yes, sir. Because I, I, my skids have been in here for, 
I don't know, ninth grade, so nine, ten years, and we've changed systems a number of times. Yes, sir. I've in been here 21 time. years, and we've yeah. changed this yeah. a number of times, and this is the best and most robust, the most robust one we will have in the division. Fairfax County and some other school divisions use it in this area. I, I think I agree with Dr. Wall. Oh, did you have a talk? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that we're missing part of the point. And, and I talked to Mr. 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 Trenum about this particular regulation. And what I said to him is that after being in this business for decades and watching the workload increase for teachers and for principals, and to document this, I'm going to pull up something that's probably familiar to Dr. Waltz. When I left the system, I left a notebook, and it talks about the roles and responsibilities of principals and teachers. And at one point, when I, we changed from being instructional leaders, from administrative leaders to instructional leaders, it increased the workload tremendously. And principals do what everybody else does, which is pass the work down. When we get more stuff to do, we pass it down to teachers. And I have, I see Ms. Rod, I see Amy White's in this room, and I also see Jarslyn. And I could call Jarslyn on Sunday afternoon, and she was in her office. When I look at my work day, and any principal's work day, it's from six to six at least, because you have to get there at six in the morning to get the work done while the teachers are not there, and you stay at six at night to get the work done when they leave. But the teachers are staying later. And so when we move to this more instructional oriented thing where teachers have interims to do, they have data analysis to do, it's, I don't know if teachers, what they're saying to me, and I think we all agree, is not about the interim. They want to release, they want to release on the workload that there's just too much for them to do in a day. They're working at night, they work on weekends. As principals, you work at night. So one of the things that I used to do, and I have several friends who also did this, and uh, it may cost a little bit of money, but there were days when it was just too much work. And as a principal, you're monitoring that. And I would like to see us put in something where, um, I used to call it a floating sub. A floating sub was when they had interims and they had so many grades to put in that I would give them a, a sub as a grade level and the grade level could do whatever she wanted to with that sub because the third grade teachers would say, we need her on this day, we need, we need time. And I think that somewhere in the system we need to think about the fact that you can automate it as much as you want, but, and I'm a workaholic, uh, Amy White is a workaholic, she's a workaholic, but I'm telling you, with this age of accountability, these teachers have too much to do. And I don't know how you address that, I don't know if you can address that in a regulation, but something, when I worked at this hospital for the, for emotionally disturbed students, they gave us what was called a, a, a day where you could just take off and call in and say, I'm tired. I need time off. But I think we need to find some way to el eliminate some of the workloads that teachers have to do. And I know some people may disagree with me, but I've done this thing for a long time, and they keep working. They don't complain to you, but all the interims, the paperwork, the benchmarks, the data analysis, it's just too much. So I would ask the superintendent and the staff to maybe find a way where they would actually tell you the truth, to survey these people and say, what, what, could you, what would I like to see you do and work on to eliminate my workload? I think that's the key to this whole thing. It's just too much to work to do. 
Okay. Um, I, I, I agree in the sense the spirit with Dr. Walt said that this will require, I think, careful consideration. And I think adjusting and looking at our new system and see how that may help benefit us. But I think it's a great beginning to a discussion that needed to be had. So thank you, Mr. Trenum. I think we'll move on to 18.08. Discussion of plan for certified staff not actively involved in instruction to spend one day per semester in the classroom. Mr. Trenum. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is this is the last of uh, this is the last of the the uh, the ideas that we bring forward, and this one I'll, this one I'll take credit for. This is a screwy one, so I'll take I'll take the credit for that. But um, uh, this is like I said, based on just conversations that I've had over the over the, over a number of years, really. Um, but it seems to me like there's a there's a disconnect between there's a disconnect between our our school based st staff. And our central office based staff, especially those those that don't get out and and go a lot, um, uh, and like I said, I know a lot of that's anecdotal, but there there's actually some there's some numbers that back that up too, or at least uh, numbers from a few years back. Back I think the the, the 2014 back back when, and I I haven't looked at the last surveys I had in the last year. So I don't know if this question is still being asked, but the infamous question number 39 was a statement that was um, said that overall, I feel the central office departments understand my school's needs, and at the overwhelmingly that was the, that was that was the statement that was the most disagreed upon statement um, across the board, just across the board. Um, I did uh, some spreadsheets that were given to me on, on some of those questions that. I think we're from the 2014-2015 school year, so it's a little bit dated. Um, but the numbers in pink are the pink on the spreadsheets are, are, are the ones that is the question number 39, and to the right is the most disagree on the scale. Um, so I think that's so we we do actually have some survey data that actually backs that up. It's not because people are intentionally trying to avoid or, or not. I don't think there's a bad intentions behind that. I think it's natural. I've seen this in, uh, you know, as, a, as a military member, both active duty and reserve, um, higher headquarters and the field units, there's always, there's always this feeling of disconnect. And it takes an active, it takes a, an active uh, effort on the, on, on the part, primarily of, on both sides, but primarily the burden falls on the he higher headquarters because that's the management side. Um, to, to overcome that and help make sure that those people feel connected. Um, the idea of having a, our uh, certificated staff that's, um, uh, that's not school-based uh, go out into the schools and actually teach, I think that's, for some I think they might find it refreshing because it does get them, get some people, it gives, gives them an opportunity to get back in the classroom on occasion because that's, you know, they've all been teachers at some point and so they all got into the teaching community so I think there, there's some actual benefits there. Uh, at least I hope some people find some uh, professional benefits and satisfaction coming out of that. Um, but I think it would help, uh, help to connect, better connect our central office staff and our uh, school staff. There's also there's the, there's the psychological impact of just seeing them in the, st in the schools doing the job and making those connections, and there's that psychological benefit. But there's also, also the fact that, at least I'm not a teacher, so, but what the, what the teachers that I've talked to said, you know what, in the last five to ten years, it's changed dramatically, and uh, being in the classroom. And so, especially with the pervasive use of the, the technology and... Uh, and just uh, that affects everything. It affects discipline. It affects how you, you know, maintain maintain the students' attention. And it's changed a lot. So I think it's good for the people that aren't in the classroom on a regular basis to get that opportunity to go back and see what it is like out in the classroom now. Um, if you want to see what it's like in an over overcrowded classroom, that's the best way is to actually go in, go there, go out there and see there. So that's where the the genesis for this came from. Is just an idea to try and. Uh, help build some connections. Um, this one was, uh, uh, th th I admit there would be a lot of, uh, a lot of discussion as far as uh, at, at what level and who does what. The implementation um, would uh, be interesting um, because I am going to pick on somebody tonight. 
I would love to see Mickey Mulgrew have to go back in and teach history in a, in a high school setting. I'll put my kid in your class. How about that? That's, I'll send him back. So Ms. Williams. That's, thought. that's all. Ms. Williams. Um, I just wanted to say, I think the, the spirit of this is, is good, um, but I know, um, especially with our associate superintendents, that they do make rounds in our schools on a regular basis. And um, just within the last two years, we've had shift in staff, and a lot of those staff came directly from our schools. So I think that, um, I mean, I know Ms. Hart's in my schools all the time. I see Mr. Vixby. If I don't see him, I'm hearing about him, not just from parents, but from staff, saying, you know, knowing that he's in the building. Um, Sorry to pick on you, Mr. Bixby, but I, I think you're one of the most, um, I'm most familiar with some of your routines is, you know, sometimes he takes a whole day and sits in a building and that's his office for a day. Um, so I think he gets a great perspective on not just what's going on in the classroom, but like in the building as well. Um, I'm not sure if mandate, mandating it is, uh, I, I'm just a person who likes a more holistic of, of, approach to things. Um, I think spending a day in a classroom is great. I know, like, for example, Dr. Healy went back because he loved teaching and he missed it. And now he's a principal and he's in the building every day. So I think it, it, it it's a kind of a double-edged sword. And I think we may run the risk of missing some other important things when um, our staff is just limited to spending the day teaching. Um, maybe it may be more useful for them to observe, have that time observing some other area of the, of the administration or I don't know what's going on in the lunchroom, just making up examples. And this is no way to say that it taking from the teaching profession or anything like that. Um, but given the duties and responsibilities that they have, uh, from my perspective, of course, I just, I would like the idea that they're more well rounded in their viewpoints in a building and not just uh, limited to teaching because teaching inter teachers interact with multiple staff and it's a uh, not just an isolated um they're not like an island among themselves in a building and there's a lot of collaboration that has to go on with various levels of teachers and different i mean for example i had a conversation with someone today who you know got upset because i was like i don't have eight hours to just sit in a classroom as a teacher the reason being is because I think there's different kinds of teachers. And in order to do that effectively, I would have to shadow an ESOL teacher and a high school teacher and a middle school teacher and an elementary school teacher and a teacher aide. And there's just so many different levels. And for me, it's easier for my brain to understand if I go out and spend time and talk to each kind of teacher so I can see their perspective. Um, that's just me. But I think um, that in recognizing that, it, the idea of going out and teaching for a day I think is great. But I just think we may run the risk of missing so much because there's so many different kinds of teachers and so many different specializations and each is very unique and I think well worth um, hearing from. So that's just my opinion on the matter. Ms. Jesse. Um, I guess the question would be, would I as a principal want Mickey Mulgrew to come in and teach <laughs> history for a day? But uh, one, I think that uh, we should assess whether or not this question says the solution is to, for central office to go out and be in classrooms for a day. I think that's something that we need to probably get a better handle on. But when I pick up my, no my notebook again, if you sent me a bunch of people to go into classrooms, this would be another piece of work for me and for teachers. And I know teachers who really don't really want um, to, they don't want subs sometimes because it's more work. So I think we need to get a sense of what, how we would do this or how, what does that question really mean? And does it mean I want them to come into my classroom every day? And there are some people who really are there are people like Jocelyn who could go in and probably teach a classroom, and then she would be better than the teacher that was in the classroom. Teachers don't like you coming in their classroom teaching their kids because it puts them in a position where you are either not as good as them or you're better than them, and that's not what they want. I think they want more contact. They want us to understand, in my mind, that I still think that they really just have too much to do. And I don't know how we get around to, to and that, they, that we 
Here we don't understand that. That's what I think is the question means. So I think we need to just look at more uh, ways of getting um, what this question really means, rather than saying the solution is, if you mandate somebody come down to teach in a classroom and they go, well, I did that, that's over. I'm not sure if it's gonna get the effects of, I, I'm not sure you're gonna end up getting what you really wanted, which I think is a better relationship with central office and the staff. So. Mickey, nothing personal, Mr. Mulgrew. <laughs> Dr. Waltz. Thank you. So several small points, and then I'll try to connect a dot. So please try to bear with me through this. So uh, one thing that we learned last year when the board uh, commissioned the staffing study at $265,000, which came back showing that every single department in the central office was understaffed with the exception of two. And in those two departments, when their work responsibilities were delineated, uh, the company said it wasn't a fair comparison because they're doing, they had more staffing, yes, but they're doing greater responsibilities. That being said, um, again, as someone who occasionally feels like the defender of the people who work in the central office, um, we have any number of people who go out and teach in the classrooms in the central office. So, uh, you know, again, I'm not, I, I, I understand this better tonight than I did when you first made the comment because I thought you were directing it at me a couple weeks ago. And the day before, I had just taught a lesson in a uh, kindergarten class out at Marshall. So I teach a number of classes, individual classes, over the course of the year. Um, I was a guest at a mini lesson at uh, one high school, at a different high school. I taught the, um, the teacher cadet uh, classroom. Uh, again, it was one block of time, but I usually split that up. We have many people who are involved in Read Across America, they go out, and then a number of folks in curriculum and instruction that actually do team teaching, the people in professional development. And let me just say, we have a very large percentage of employees in the Kelly Building who 90% of their time is in schools. So, um, you know, again, I just wanna try to set the record straight on a couple of those things. Going back to 2005, 2006, I had a principal by the name of Tim Healy say to me on my, um, what was that? 82 schools in 82 days. So when I went to OP, I met him for the first time, and he said that he was interested in teaching an English class, but that his previous uh, associate superintendent had not allowed him to do that. And what did I think of that? I said, I think it's a fantastic idea. And so the next semester, he taught a period of English. Uh, in fact, he got a fantastic Washington DC Metro News uh, coverage of in-depth coverage out in the school and, and on and on and on. So I will have to say all those other points I made, I support central office people being out in the classroom. They can do that now. Um, I can make that clearer. The other thing is I wouldn't want to require everyone to do that because if I, if I name someone like in the finance office that may love numbers only, I don't want to offend Mr. Klein <laughs> or any of his people. Uh, and and that, I'm just making that up hypothetically. We may have somebody in his office that would love to go out and teach a spreadsheet class. But I'm saying, I think, it's, I think we have to be careful about putting people out there that maybe aren't comfortable. Uh, they could do observations, as you said. Um, and then the other thing is, we have to make sure that, the, that there is a value added to what they're doing when they're out there for the students. Because we constantly hear closing the gap, closing the gap. And then finally, uh, so again, I'm I'm pretty supportive of this and, and making it clear, but I did want to give you the most recent data. Yes, we still ask, 
and uh, the latest executive administration understands the needs of the schools. Approximately 70% had a combined of either strongly agree or agree. So I think we made some improvement since uh, the last one there. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wolf. I, I appreciate that. Like I said, I appreciate you going out in the schools. I think, um, I think publicizing that is an opportunity. I think that's a that's a that, that's a good that's a good plan. That's a good start. Like I said, this was just an idea to help build some connections because I uh, I do still get some uh, get uh, a lot of concerns about that. Um, I know um, Mr. Ronco had me in his class a couple of times. Uh, over the years, um, it was extremely ed educational for me. It was a lot of fun, too. As the numbers guy, I, uh, um, I, I don't think Mr. Klein was too offended, but uh, um, it was, and I, and I had very good supervision while I was there, so I didn't do anything stupid, too stupid. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but anyway, like, like I said, this, this is just one of, the, one of the ideas. I do know some other school divisions do this type of thing. Mm -hmm. I think it would be help, helpful for us to over over time, look and see what they do, and see if see if that's something that would be useful for us. So, like I said, this is this is really trying to prompt it and drive a discussion and prompt a discussion as, as far as the way we can make improve some connections. So. Thank you, everyone. It was an excellent discussion. I um, you know I spent some time doing. Uh, I did a career day at Forest Park this year, and uh, was very impressed with the number of our staff from here that came out to talk to the students about their careers. Um, there was at least five or six that uh, at that, that time period that I went. And so I was very impressed that they took their time out to reach out to the students to explain to them you know, what they're doing here and, and the kind of opportunities and career options that exist in the field of education outside just even teaching. Um, so I think, you know, just as Dr. Walt said, and I think as Lori pointed out, I, I see a lot of our folks from Central always inside schools and talking to some of our folks. And I think maybe doing more of that um, is, is important and, and publicizing the things that we already are doing well is great. Thank you, Dr. Waltz. Mm -hmm. I think we'll move on to 1809 board matters. Miss Jesse, just as a point of order, had to leave. She wasn't um, not feeling well. So um, we're going to... Start today with Mr. Deutsch on this side. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the interest of time, I will pass. Uh, Ms. Williams. Okay. Well, um, I just wanted to remind everyone, since this is our last um, school board meeting of the year and school is already out, if you know a child um, or anyone under the age of 18, who may need some uh, food during the summer, you can text 877-877 um, to find out Prince William County Schools food program. Um, all of our schools are participating in some kind of way, shape, or form. And um, you probably do know someone that needs some food, whether you know it or not. So maybe a good resource just to share. Um, I have to say, this is a moment in time where I actually miss Mill the most because he always had like a cool book for summer mm -hmm. reading and I'm just not that talented because I'm always gonna recommend a Dr. Seuss book. This is just one of my favorites. And there's just so much to learn from Dr. Seuss books, no matter how old you are. Um, I, I, I love it. When the teacher came in her Dr. Seuss outfit, I'm telling you, I was impressed. Those in drum line. Anyway, so um, Along the same lines, is I just want to remind parents that there and students who are watching or listening that Prince William County Public Library puts on a summer reading program every year. And I don't know what they do now. I used to do it when I was a kid. We used to get little stamps in a book. I'm sure they have something way cooler now that they give away for students, probably like McDonald's coupons or something. But um, it's important to continue your learning over the course of the summer, whether it's reading a book, getting out, walking in a park, uh, making a new dish, whatever the case may be. I don't think learning is something you should stop for the summer, and there's always a fun way to um, incorporate learning something new in your day. And then on a more exciting note, not that those weren't exciting, I just wanted to announce um, I asked my elected representative, uh, Congressman Connolly, to enter our uh, historic school board members into a congressional record. And I found out today that that is going to happen. So our uh, landmark 
counting decision is now a matter of congressional record and history, and our stu school student representatives, um, all three of them will be entered into the congressional record for their achievement as serving on the board, and you know, I'm just completely nuts about that, so I just wanted to share that. I'll have actual copies um, at the next board meeting, which would be in the fall, if anybody wants to take a look at it, I'm sure we can figure out a way to post it or something like that, but um, I just wanted to congratulate them again, and I'm really excited about the excuse me, next crap, crop of students coming in. And once, I know, right, sorry. And once again, I just think that um, it was a fabulous decision by this board and I'd like to thank the board for um, you know, voting in favor of it and changing and making history for Prince William County Schools. Uh, we, we definitely do that a lot, so it's just something I'm really proud of and that's it, thank you. Mr. Wilk. Thank you, uh, I wanna thank Central Office for staying late all these many, many meetings. Uh, and I wanna thank Mr. Klein and Mr. Johnson for their service and everyone else out in the school system who are retiring or leaving for whatever reason. Thank you for your service and uh, looking forward to uh, a couple months off. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I too would like to thank uh, Mr. Jo uh, Johnson Thank you very much. You taught me so much. Uh, and I'm glad I was able to help so that things will go faster. And I'm surprised you want to leave before you have that opportunity. Stay a little bit longer. And Mr. Klein, thank you very much. Because I always thought money was a little bit until I met you. And you made it look like a lot. So instead of me running out, I guess, buying or some land, to build a school, I'll call you first. Thank you very much, both of you, for everything that you have done for Prince William County Schools. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've already talked a lot tonight, so more than more probably than the rest of the year. So I'll, I'll just be. I want to quick. I want to congratulate the uh, students of Brinsville District High School uh, seniors that graduated this last year. That was the last graduation I went uh, that I went to. Um, like I said, that one was special because my baby graduated now. So I, I have aged. Yes, my 225 pound baby. Um, he's a big boy. Um, but. Uh, uh, but so congratulations to the students of Brentsville. Uh, Ricky, you did a great job on your speech. Um, um, it was a, a great job there. And then um, I want to congratulate uh, Ms. Elizabeth Meldrum, who was the recipient of the 2018 uh, Austin Trenton Memorial Scholarship this award. Uh, once again, congratulations, Lizzie. You did, you did just great. I'm really proud of you. Um, watching you, gr you grow up from elementary school, it was really heartwarming to see you get the award. So everybody have a good summer, and uh, Mr. Wilk, if you want to join Ms. Williams and I on the uh, policy stuff, you're welcome to join us for the summertime. That's all. Have a good summer, everyone. Bye. There, there is a limit on two, oh, yes, no sorry. three. Otherwise, then everyone else will be invited. We may need a sub Ms. Satterwhite. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was kind of confused about that summer off. Let's see, we have a conference in July. We're talking about a board retreat and training. Hmm, where's that time off? <laughs> we'll give you a little bit of break for the next couple of weeks. Um, I want to wish everybody a great summer vacation. I know all of you have started it. We're looking forward to getting a little bit of one. I know some of our staff members have started it. Um, I also want to wish Mr. Johnson, Mr. Klein, congratulations on your retirement. And to all of our retirees, um, you will be missed. Thank you for your service to Prince William County Schools, our students and our staff. So thank you very much. Um, I also want to thank um, the folks at Youth for Tomorrow for meeting with Mr. Mulgrew, Mr. Bixby, Ms. Ralston, and I. Um, thank you to Dr. Gary Jones, Dr. Terry Tensley, Love Jones, no relation to Dr. Gary Jones, uh, Lawrence Hub, Veronica Myers, and Natalia Becker. I, it was a fabulous um, update on what they're doing at Youth for Tomorrow, our partnership with them, what all of their operations involve. We did a tour. and. Um, Ms. Ralston and I have also asked if we can possibly have a update here in the boardroom from Youth for Tomorrow with what our partnership with Youth for Tomorrow involves with Prince William County Schools. But uh, I want to thank them for the work that they do with our students, um, helping our students with um, behavioral health issues, mental health issues, and it's a great partnership and they do some great work. So it was a really terrific uh, meeting that we had. Um, wish everybody a wonderful summer. 
as Ms. Williams said, keep reading, keep learning, take advantage of the library's summer reading program. There are prizes involved if you get signed up, at least there used to be, I think there still are. And we'll see you all back in September. Thank you to everyone. Thank you for putting up with my um, orientation and learning on how to try to do this job. I truly appreciate that. And if I have made any mistakes, please forgive me. I will continue to work hard at trying to um, do the best job I can. Um, a couple things since our last meeting, I did attend one last commencement. That was at Thomas Jefferson School for Science and Technology. Um, what's that? Oh, and then, so I, I will do the summer school graduation too, as, as Ms. Williams July recommended. 26. July 26th, summer school graduation. Um, but I did attend that one. Um, thank you to Mr. Trenum for having me over to his place to, uh, for his son's graduation. Congratulations to him as well. To Mr. Johnson and Mr. Klein, thank you for your tremendous years of service. Commitment, you are truly well respected and loved here in the community, and, and I wish you both the best on your uh, retirement. and and hope you really enjoy it. Um, not, not public. Um, and that really, I will just wrap it up. You know, as far as students, please read. I think that has echoed, uh, there's great programs at the school. And since Ms. Jess, Ms. Williams challenged me because the former chair, I guess, or two chairs ago, had book recommendations. I do have a book recommendation, and I don't know if you can see it, but it's called What School Could Be by Ted Dintersmith, um, fabulous read. Um, he had traveled around all 50 different states looking at different programs, innovative programs around the country. And um, it, I think you'll really enjoy it. It's not, it's not very long, has some great vignettes about you know, you know, programs that are doing some really cool things. So best wishes and have a great summer all. Thank you. <laughs>